Okay, let's get started for day two. Uh, welcome, welcome everyone. Hope you had a uh, great evening last night and uh, international visitors got a, a bit of a chance to explore Perth and all its wonders. Um, so one of the really, I'm the chair for the first session today. Um, one of the really nice things about this meeting, I think, is not just hearing about all the cool science and engineering and software and technology, but is to also celebrate some of our really fundamental partnerships that, um, that we've been part of uh, over the years and also celebrate some of the partnerships to come. So that's a bit of the theme of uh, this morning. Uh, so first up, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Ronnie Curley. Ronnie is the manager of Yamaji Art in Geraldton. Um, and we've been working together for a long time on a lot of really cool stuff. And uh, I think you'll really enjoy Ronnie's presentation of some of those details. And um, great, thanks for coming down from Geraldton, uh, Ronnie, today. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, thank you, guys. Um, this morning, I'd actually like to start with a, an acknowledgement to country. Um, Sakaya so Wanju, uh, which is hello and welcome. Um, I just want to pay respects to the Wajak um, Noongar Nation in which we're actually presenting today, to pay acknowledgement and respect to the elders past and present for the um, legacy that they've left, they left uh, through all the challenges that they've actually had um, over the years, and just take a moment's um, silence just to pay that respect. Thank you. So as um, Stephen's already um, introduced me, my name is Ronnie Curley. I'm the uh, I'm actually a Manang Nudju Noongar from the southwest of Western Australia, but I've lived on Yamiji country for almost 30 years. Um, been at the Art Centre for seven. Um, so almost a lifetime. I, I kind of work in seven year lots. So for me, seven years is like a lifetime for me. And um, during that time, we've um, I certainly have uh, enjoyed my experience. I've been quite uh, fortunate to actually be a part of the Art Centre since I was 14. So um, the Art Centre itself is actually it's, um, 20, 24 years old. So um, it is the Midwest's longest uh, running Aboriginal art centre. We're 100% Aboriginal controlled, operated and owned. Um, so the Art Centre actually started in uh, late 1994 as a result of some students graduating from the local TAFE from a, um, a certificate in arts. But so when, when they actually graduated, they didn't have anywhere to go in the arts um, industry in the Midwest. So they all got together essentially and off the, of their own cuff kind of started the Art Centre. During that time, there's been lots of achievements held by the Art Centre as well. And one of those is one of the, um, the relationship that we actually have formed with um, the DSIRO, Curtin and Stephen himself. Uh, it's been about 15 years, I think, the relationship's been going on. So as a part of the uh, consultation process of working with the traditional owners out on Wadjuri country with the development of the MRO, the SKA, the MWA, um, Stephen actually worked with our artists to come together and share the night sky story essentially as Aboriginal people we have looked to the night sky for millennium basically just as long as you guys are looking back we've also looked at the night sky as well so there was an ideal opportunity to come together during that relationship and exploring the use of the land etc to have a an immersion of two cultures essentially so a western uh, view of the night sky but also how the Yamiji Wadjuri people view the night sky so um, there was a, I think it was the first visit out to Mullawal, Stephen, when you yourself had worked with the artists and actually experienced them seeing the emu in the night, emu in the sky for the first time. So is everybody aware of the culture story of the emu in the sky, Seven Sisters, etc. for those that have? Okay. So um, the emu in the sky essentially is a weather pattern or a formation amongst the uh, the Milky Way that dictates and informs our hunting and weather patterns. So it was great for us to be able to go out bush and have an exchange of how we actually see and move with the night sky as well as um, at the scientists as well. And um, Charmaine actually shared a, 
bit of a funny story with me that when us as the, as the traditional owners went out on country and then we've got the, the, the scientists and the, um, the astronomers out there, that's two, two different groups of people. You could be as different as you could possibly be. We're very arty, very emotive in the way that we operate and we interpret things. But then you have the astronomers and, and um, scientists who are very data-driven, very factual, very knowledge, very... And so we're kind of like these two massively different groups. And um, she talked about how when, when it started to go a little bit dark, the, the, astro the astronomers started to get all excited and started moving about and become quite animated. And then as Aboriginal people, we, we started to get really excited and animated as well because we could see what you can see and you can see what we could see and all of a sudden we're all seeing the same thing. And through that is when we actually realise that we do have what we call a shared sky. Nobody owns the sky, but we all sit beneath it and we all have relatively different stories or different relationships to the night sky. So that's how we came together, I think, and started to learn and share and explore um, our knowledge, your knowledge, and together we wanted to see how we can bring that all together essentially and celebrate um, how you've informed us and taught us how to look at the night sky and how we've taught you to have a look at the night sky. One of the artists that went out there, um, our senior artist, Margaret Whitehurst, she, again, it's one of those funny stories that, you know, when you listen to the night sky, when you don't know what you're listening to, all you hear is static. And you just think that the TV's gone off or something, you know. She was just like, that's not the night sky. There's no way that could be the universe. But she come to understand that and through that she explored how she could take what she heard and, and created these beautiful pieces of artwork and essentially everybody in attendance actually created these beautiful pieces of artwork um, which came about uh, two large bodies of artwork called Ilgaritri, which is things belonging to the sky, and also a uh, collaborative project called Shared Sky with the uh, South Australian artists, obviously the second location um, in South Australia that you have the satellites as well. So through those um, two bottles, two bodies of work became these beautiful pieces of artwork, essentially. Oh, I'll just show you. I'll show you Stephen first. This is actually when we went out. So these images are actually 15 years old, looking very dapper there. Um, Stephen with some emu eggs. Um, again, this is another funny story around the, uh, the fire here. This is in the middle of summer, okay? It's like 45 degree heat. But there was this kind of romanticised notion of sitting around a campfire having a yarn, you know? So we're well, like the photographers wanted to capture that and the, the videographers wanted to capture this sitting around the night sky and under the sitting around a fire, campfire. And everyone's looking at each other. Well, our mob, anyway, we're looking at each other going, this, these people are crazy, <laughs> absolutely crazy, but we'll give them what they want, you know, because we're very giving people. So, um, yeah, we, that, that image is of us sitting of the artist sitting in a 45-degree heat around this big bonfire, essentially. But the, um, the children themselves love the experience as well, being able to see the night sky through a telescope um, and up close and personal. I also have my own um, experience with that just recently. Last year, I think it was, Stephen took me out and I seen Saturn for the first time. And that, for me, is actually even at the age of... I was 44 at the time. It's become a core memory for me to be able to see this beautiful planet the way that it was. So these are just some images essentially of um, that visit. Uh, as I uh, mentioned, so we had um, two bodies of work, uh, Shared Sky and Ilgaridjuri. And uh, for the arts in there was approximately 20 different artists involved. So that's actually quite a lot of artists to be involved in such a, a body of work. Um, they've had a, a, an amazing touring history as well. So they've, they've toured throughout Belgium, in Canberra, um, Brussels, Hague, Netherlands, Manchester. So um, there's beautiful pieces of artwork that came from this uh, partnership of captured everybody um, nationally and internationally as well. So um, there were just a couple of other different kind of projects that happened throughout that time as well, uh, different documentaries, et cetera. And I'll just show some images of the actual artwork and how they were interpreted from, from the night sky as well. So as you know, you've got um, a Lacerta 
over, over here. So Margaret Whitehurst, our senior artist, has actually interpreted that. And then you have the emu, uh, the emu in the sky through the Milky Way as well. So that was done by another senior artist, um, Craig Pickett. And um, we've got Jupiter in the Ten Moons by Barbara Merritt on the, on the left here. She's one of our senior artists and another interpretation of the Emu in the Sky by Margaret Whitehurst as well. And then just a couple of um, different... So this one on the end is actually the interpretation of the sound waves. So this is how the artist has actually taken what they've heard, interpreted and then created a piece of artwork, which I just think is beautiful. And then um, I always believe in, in bringing the artist's voice in the room. You know, this was actually happening before my time. So I just think that it's quite important that I have one of the artists um, speak as well. So this is uh, Jenny Green. And do I just press it again? Yeah, okay. So these were actually filmed around the same time and it's her interpretation or her speaking about her cultural um, view of the night sky. Hello, I'm Jennifer and I'm, I'm Barimaya Wadjuri. I grew up in Wadjuri country and um, when I was a kid, I grew up all around the Wadjuri country and um, learnt about the, all the sky stories, the Seven Sisters. I used to always like hear, hearing that, looking up in the sky at night because we slept outside a lot when we were kids. We always looked up at the stars, um, and yeah, and and the, and the, I still always feel sorry for the, the the sick sister, where the old man was chasing him, and she was sick, and he's trying, he's just about catching up to her, and you could see in the sky how dull uh, she is, and the the rest of the sisters are strong, they're very shining brightly, and she's weakening and getting less and less light. And uh, yeah, so I'm, well now I'm glad I grew up looking up in the sky and learning those stories, and maybe reintroduce and um, teach teach everybody at, all about it, and um, because I think that's really important to share that story with everybody and and make sure it's still still around for generations to come. So I just wanted to touch on what Jenny was speaking about there in terms of uh, continuing the storytelling of our of our culture. Um, we can't, I guess, we can't steer away from the impacts that colonisation has actually had on us as a people. You know, um, with with the the degradation of our our language, our families, um, and some of our, our kinship systems because of the stolen generation. One of the things that people haven't taken away from us is our connection to the night sky, irrespective of where it is that our children have been placed with different families, where we have been displaced amongst um, the state, etc. The sky has always been there. So as Aboriginal people, that's probably been the one factor that's always remained with us is the connection to the night sky. So. I guess when these opportunities to come to come along, whether it's through exhibitions, whether it's through partnerships with scientists, whether it's through storytelling, um, we, as an art centre, we really want to take up those opportunities and, and we revel in being able to celebrate our culture and to, to be able to, to say, we're still here, you know, we're very much still here. Um, and although just like a, a, a a star may extinguish, it takes a long time for it to actually go away. So that original point of an attempt to extinguish us as a people, the impacts are still kind of here today. But, you know, it's, a, it's our responsibility and different partnerships responsibility to, to acknowledge that and actually support us in also growing back that fire amongst ourselves and, and sharing culture and all opportunities basically to, to exchange knowledge and learn from each other, I think. So these relationships that we've actually had with Curtin have been um, exactly that. And I would have to say that I've, in my 30 year career history, I've worked in several different, um, different roles, whether it be in federal government, child protection, um, cultural programs, etc. I would have to say that the relationship with Curtin has been in the true essence of reconciliation. 
and it's true partnership, it's true learning and, and more importantly, listening. So I just wanted to say thank you to Stephen, obviously, and, and for those that I have not met that were part of the actual relationship at the, at the beginning, um, just to say thank you for giving us the time to, to want to learn and exchange culture and knowledge with each other. I think that's been really important. So, yeah, because um, it continues for us to be able to celebrate that as well. Uh, another one of those opportunities uh, is when we actually went international and we took the uh, Shared Sky collection over to Manchester. And so there was a public collaboration experience there as well. So again, it's one of those opportunities where people from um, international forums got to learn our culture and, and how we went about business, but through visual arts, you know, I mean, like people take visual arts for granted, I think, and the storytelling capacity behind it as well. So for us to be able to do that, um, can anybody kind of guess what the pattern layout is on? You should all know. <laughs> yeah, so we actually wanted to bring that in again to honour the relationship that we had um, with the Sky, with the MRO, the SKA, with Curtin. Uh, and we, we used the antennas basically to, to kind of lay out a pattern and then everybody came and um, had, a, had a go at um, contributing to the, to the canvas. Um, another one of the projects that we recently have just done was a partnership with, um, again, um, Curtin and uh, Prospero Productions, which is a Fremantle-based company. So this one was um, called Star Dreaming. So has anyone heard of Star Dreaming? Yeah, okay. So. Um, it was a 180 degree immersive experience, and I tell you, this was an experience. Not only, not only was the, the the resulting production in the film an experience, but the whole filming process, being out on country, and uh, filming behind the scenes is not as romantic as you think. You know, as they lead you to believe. Having a a, a senior artist in again, 50, I don't know what it is with people wanting to go out in the middle of the bloody summer. And to film these things, you know, you've got you've got elderly people walking up and down um, riverbeds in 50 degree heat, you know, and it was just uh, I don't think we were pre prepared for saying the same lines over 100 times to get it right, to get it right, to get it right. But it was absolutely beautiful. The end product um, again, it was to me a true spirit of reconciliation. It really showed the the night sky through the lens that you guys see it and through the way that we also see it. Um, so that included going out to Bilardi Station um, as well, and that was when Stephen actually took me um, and showed me the satin, which again I just absolutely love. So this film itself is actually um, won Best Educational Award. It was the finalist in the WA Premier Science Award for Chevron, and um, it's been over to LA, to Canada, to Man Manchester. So again, it's another one of those initiatives where we get to take it internationally and share our culture and knowledge. So here we have Barbara, Kevin and um, Margaret. So they they also um, star in the film. So five of their paintings that kind of convey the cultural night sky have been animated essentially and placed in, in the dome. If you ever get the opportunity to, I highly suggest that you do watch the film. I've, I've watched it about six times and I'm still blown away each one of the times. Just This was the promotional um, video that we've done, so I'll just give you a little bit of an insight into what it looked like. A magical odyssey is about to begin. The world's oldest living culture and cutting edge science taking us deeper into space than ever before. Join us on this incredible immersive journey Star Dreaming in the Dawn. So again, if you ever get the opportunity, I, on, honestly, um, the, the graphics on it as well, I mean, like you are completely immersed in it. You do actually feel like you're in the galaxy, that you're going across country. So that was, that was great. And as always, we'd like to have some behind the scenes images. You can't use <laughs> memories or trauma. No. <laughs> it was an amazing experience. It was it actually, yeah. So um, Stephen's getting all dirtied up here because you know we're out in the middle of nowhere. You can't be clean. You cannot be clean. Okay. 
Um, and one, one of the things that oh, I've got to share the little story about the, yep. Uh, on the bottom, um, bottom one here, you can see in front of uh, Stephen this kind of mass. We wanted to be able to represent the ever expanding universe, essentially, it keeps growing, it's growing and growing. And we kind of come across this idea that we'll, you know, we'll use dough, dough it rises, you know. In principle, it was great, but in the middle of nowhere, I don't know whether it was my cooking skills or not, but this thing would not rise. It was flat as a pancake, okay? It was so flat. But we still needed to have that kind of body to it. So believe it or not, and you, in the middle of nowhere, you have to um, improvise. That is full of toilet paper, okay? That was the only way that we realised we could get some height to this thing. So, yeah, I mean, these, yeah, it was lots of fun, lots and lots of fun doing that. Um, the two young, the two young guys as well that were out on country with us. We had uh, Lucia and Max. They they were absolute stars. Lucia has gone on to achieve some absolutely amazing things. Again, credit to our artists having to be in the middle of nowhere, repeating the same things over and over a hundred times, and just persevering through the whole process. So we can't go without acknowledging the hard work that they've actually done. Some of the other projects that we've we've done over the years. Uh, we've got a public art commission uh, that we, is uh, commonly referred to as the Eggs on the Foreshore, but it represents the Seven Sisters story as well. So um, they're down in Geraldton. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a quality enough image, but um, that happens. Um, one of our artists, uh, Margaret Whitehurst, has had her artwork reproduced on two occasions to the supercomputer, so we're very proud of that. The yarn bombing of the... Um, the actual, again, we're out in the middle of nowhere in the heat and it's, it's beautiful. Um, we also had the antennas put into the British Museum for our, um, 100 uh, objects, basically, and uh, limited edition coin around the Seven Sisters story. The mint sold out of those within two days and it was actually one of the fastest selling coins that they've ever made, so we were quite proud of that. Uh, fashion, so this is Barbara Whitehurst, uh, no, sorry, Barbara Merritt's artwork, Seven Sisters, so that actually was um, re reduced onto um, several different um, outfits on the antipodium. What's next? Okay. We would love to be able to continue and grow our relationships with Curtin, so we've been kind of having some conversations behind the scenes about what it is that we're going to be doing um, in the night sky kind of um, arena. Uh, we're going to be having a, an exhibition in November, uh, locally in Geraldton, and also uh, we've had some kind of preliminary discussions with the Singaporean artists around the Space Junk Initiative that they're kind of working on, so we'd love to be involved in that. But one of the little things that I'm kind of excited about is that Mia kind of approached me with this, with this bizarre looking things that I now know that you guys actually really love and um, she asked me to artify them. I think that was the words. <laughs> so we are, um, we got given, I'll bring them out. I'll put them on the, on the large screen as well. So we got given your sound waves. These here are absolutely Petrifying to paint, apparently. <laughs> but they uh, they turned out absolutely beautiful, and it, we just got so creative. And I thought to myself, we could actually come up with an award-winning entry into the Na National Telstra Award, which is a yeah. Honestly, they're absolutely beautiful, and you could be so creative. The way that I see it, we can turn these into galaxies, light them up and have an installation up the wall, all these kind of different ways. So we are looking forward to seeing how we can grow and expand on these as well. This one's a bit sticky, but if you wanted to, to we'll yeah, leave them up the front. And then Mia gave me a small one and I got even more excited. <laughs> I think my artist would have been happier with the small one because she was so she was so frightened of it. And she was just like, I'm going to break it. I'm like, no, 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 you're not going to break it at all. Um, so that essentially concludes my presentation from Yamiji Art and our relationship. And um, I guess I really look forward to, to keeping it going and seeing what we can do in the future. Thank, thank you.
Uh, wow, Ronnie, that's incredible. And thank you for an amazing talk. It brought back a lot of memories for me. Uh, there must be some questions from the audience uh, for Ronnie. I'd be surprised if Ron doesn't have a question. I'm surprised I didn't ask Thank you. temperature is a good temperature to do filming in or something. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to ask a question, but I like the spirit of exchanging knowledge by storytelling. Which Absolutely. Is something we can learn from yeah. your community. So I was just going to tell a tiny story because you reminded me of it as I was talking. Uh, and it's the shared sky. Uh, I was in a place called North Cape in the tip of Norway, looking at the midnight sun. And it suddenly struck me, my family in Australia are seeing the same sun at the same time. So it's it's the international global version of this shared sky. Absolutely. And it just struck me as, well, like you just said it, we're sharing, we were sharing something. In this case, different parts of the globe instead of different cultures. And I think, you know, that's one, the sky's home for me personally. I, I, I personally, I have a personal belief and opinion that we are born of the sky. We are born of the night sky and we will return to the night sky. But um, it is something that we can all hold on to. Even in some of the most toughest times, the sky is beautiful. You know, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world or where you are, what you're experiencing. When that sun goes down, the night sky's just beautiful doesn't matter what's going on behind you. So that beauty we all get to share, I guess. Yeah, and it, it's it's global. You remind me of a story. The traditional method of navigating around the South Pacific is via your home star, yeah. which is a star that has a declination the same as the uh, latitude of your island. So I imagine these people striking out for a, a distant island and on that island being able to see their, their home star. And they knew that that was what they needed to go to to get home at the end of the day. So some pretty universal themes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Emma, did you have a? Um, thanks for this presentation. It was really interesting. We've definitely found, well, I definitely don't think visual art is underrated at all. Um, and especially for astronomy outreach, we found it really, really useful for communicating ideas to the public. And I just wanted to ask, what's the project for space sustainability and space junk? I think it was one bullet point on your Yeah, page. so... Um, so um, the Singaporean-based artist, Isabella Ong, she's actually working um, on a, a, a collaboration or an exhibition called Lucy in the Sky with Debris. So it's around... <laughs> So obviously it's around the impacts that you know, there's a lot of junk on earth you know we, we pollute the earth but we forget about the impacts that um, it all has on the night sky too and as aboriginal people there are ramifications whether it's now or whether it's in the future of how that actually impacts and informs the way that we interact with the night sky as well obviously there are constellations that can get impacted um, Min -min, what we call min-min light. So we have a, this story around lights in the night sky. When they appear, there's a particular cultural phenomenon that's attached to it. Can you imagine when you have debris or meteorites or other things that appear when they shouldn't be appearing and how that can actually inform and impact our storylines? So I just thought it was a, a unique opportunity, basically, to kind of come together and explore, again, the Western view of space junk and, and how it also can inform our cultural practices and our stories and song lines as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, space junk clearly has a big impact on radio astronomy as well. It's so nice, yeah. Isabella is um, going to be our first artist in residence and she'll be here for the month of September and hopefully coming up to Geraldton to work with you guys. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Sam. Um, you said you were from Manang country. I was wondering if there are any differences between um, the night sky stories that uh, are prevalent down there versus uh, where you work now. Um, without going into too much depth, because I don't have the cultural authority to actually explore all of it, because there are different layers of cultural authority when it comes to the night sky. Um, I guess in WA in particular, the one um, kind of, it's the emu in the sky, so that informs the practices around um, weather, kind of um, 
literal weather patterns, hunting practices, etc. There aren't too many different variations. Uh, we might have a different version of the Seven Sisters. Um, largely, that's actually the Southern Cross as well. So it, there are different variations, but I can't get into too much kind of um, detail around which stories are, are where, essentially. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Uh, we might let you off the hook at this point, Ronnie, but um, I'm sure there are probably a bunch more questions. You're going to be hanging around a bit. I'm sure people will. Yeah, I'm interested. I've been doing some research. I want to see what all this is about. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you. let's thank Ronnie again. Awesome to talk. Uh, so we move next to uh, hear from Dr. Emma Tolley, who's uh, from EPFL and representing our new Swiss partners. So now we get to hear about uh, future partnerships. Thanks, Emma. Uh, yes, there, there is, although it might be easier to point and if you use a microphone around. Um, I'll leave that there. Hi everyone. Um, so as Stephen mentioned yesterday, Switzerland is interested in joining the MWA. And today I'm just going to present to you sort of the status of that, why we're considering joining, and just an overview of what we hope we can bring to the collaboration. So first of all, this is a short timeline of what's been going on. Um, back in February, we finally formed our preliminary consortium of interested Swiss researchers. Back in 2013, we presented our application to the MWA board which was approved unanimously, thanks, and approved um, And then currently we're moving towards Swiss accession to the MWA collaboration. In the near future, we hope to actually formally join the MWA collaboration. And additionally, we need to make our formal Swiss consortium. Um, so this is just, for those of you who aren't familiar with Switzerland, um, this is just a, a small map of, of everyone who's involved um, with some of the involved institutions. Um, so we have the federal universities, EPFL, where I'm based, and ETH Zurich, as well as the Swiss National Supercomputing Center, CSCS, in Lugano, as well as a few other universities and institutes. There are actually two new partners on here that were not part of our initial letter of interest to sort of, we've sort of sucked them into the, to the vortex of joining MWA. Um, and I'll show some of their sort of points of interest in the following slides. So a pretty big consortium, all things considered, but you know, we all know each other very well. All of these universities are part of the Swiss SKA collaboration. And additionally, we work on a bunch of interdisciplinary projects even beyond the SKA. Um, so in the rest of this talk, this might be a bit overwhelming. I tried to cram in as much information as I thought I could reasonably fit into my sort of 25 minute time slot. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our path towards joining the Square Kilometer Array, then talk, give a brief overview of some technical and developmental projects related to radio astronomy in Switzerland, then finally talk about which aspects of MWA science the Swiss researchers are interested in, and finally some of our interest in some of the technical developments related to MWA. Um, so Switzerland and the SKO, um, we were actually the first nation to officially join the NGO of the SKO um, back in January 2022, which is quite nice. Um, and then we also, around the same time, officially formed the Swiss SKA Consortium, SCATCH for short, um, to manage the strategic direction of Switzerland as an SKO member. Um, and then in terms of what we're doing for the SKO, um, we have a lot of industry partners who've, who have contracts for doing the time management and observatory control for the SKO. And also one university working on radio receiver technology for the hopeful mid-band six upgrade. In terms of software development, we're working on co-design, and this is for you, Ugo. For co-design, I do specifically mean benchmarking, optimization, and refactoring of the SK calibration and imaging pipeline. Thus far, this has mostly been the LOFAR software, but eventually this will also extend to um, the SK mid pipeline as well. Of course, the SK regional center network uh, we hope to host our own SK regional center at CSCS. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can get some lessons from Posi about the, the data management and the different storage systems that we'll need to deploy. Um, and then finally, lots of work going on in terms of preparation for scientific analysis. So this is not like formal work that's affiliated with the SKO, 
But we have, of course, people who are associated with the SK science working groups, um, various people working sort of beyond radio astronomy on new analysis strategies and algorithms, stuff in data science, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is just a, a picture of um, some of the people who were at the SCATCH meeting last spring. Um, the Swiss SK consortium is over 100 members now have joined um, from different institutions across Switzerland. And you know, this is a very interdisciplinary group where scientists, data scientists, engineers, project managers, professionals and outreach administrators, and of course students, our vision is to try to further Swiss leadership in the global radio astronomy community. And our mission is to try to ensure meaningful contributions to the SKO and the regional centers through the development and delivery of cutting edge Swiss solutions. Okay, but we're doing more than just the SKO sketch stuff, of course. So this is an example of a few instruments that we're working on in Switzerland. Um, so ETH Zurich is a big part of the Hyrax telescope, the hydrogen intensity and real time analysis experiment. This is a radio interferometer that's being built in the Karoo De Desert in South Africa. Um, with 256, this is the, the hopeful upgrade that they're going to get to, six meter dishes operating between 400 and 800 megahertz. The main scientific goals of this instrument are H1 intensity mapping and also surveying the transient radio sky. If you're interested in looking, uh, learning more about this, this instrument, um, there's a pretty nice review by Crichton et al. 2021. Then um, FHNW, the University of the Northwest, um, has also been involved in the Swiss X-ray telescope sticks, which is part of the ESA Solar Orbiter spacecraft. And they also did software development for the Euclid Space Telescope. Um, in terms of pipelines and imaging software, we're involved in a few different projects. This is just two that I, that I picked, but I think are nice representative examples. Um, at EPFL, we're involved in this Radio Blocks Consortium, which is one of these Horizon Europe proposals to try to develop scientific infrastructure. Um, and we're working with um, Astron and LOFAR to explore sort of new data sets for radio astronomy that are a bit more HPC friendly, HPC being high performance computing, um, tools for distributing workflows, mostly looking at DASC at the moment, and then also GPU development um, of the LOFAR pipeline. Then we're also looking into new solutions for imaging, trying to go beyond WS Clean. Um, and so we're working on Blue Build Plus Plus. This is a big collaboration between mathematicians, um, signal processing scientists, uh, radio astronomers, and HPC developers um, at EPFL and CSCS. Um, and the idea of this algorithm is to use functional PCA to separate the visibilities, and then you can sort of create your images of the sky sorting to different energy levels. I have lots of backup slides on this if people have questions afterwards. Um, and we're working on the HPC development. Um, we have a public code repository for this now and should have a corresponding paper soon. And there have been lots of developments in this to try to make the imaging a bit faster. So one thing that we're doing is doing like domain partitioning of the Fourier transform. Obviously, you don't have uniform coverage of UV space with your visibility baselines, right? Um, and so when you can you can sort of split your Fourier transform operation into multiple different steps because it's a linear operation, then you actually massively save on memory usage. And so this top plot is by Simon Frisch at CSCS who developed this domain gridding. And we see that as we increase the sort of partition size, so like the number of depths that you're splitting your FFT into, you sort of massively decrease the memory. And I mean, that's a sort of linear scale on the x-axis there, logarithmic scale on the y-axis, and you still see that ex exponential drop. So really, really good memory assessment and also speed up. Um, and then we've been working really hard on the GPU and CPU implementations of this algorithm. And you can see this is a result actually from the past week that we've finally, finally gotten our GPU implementation um, to be as fast as WS Clean. And this is doing like a full 3D FFT, so no, no W stacking, no gridding, which is quite nice. We're comparing to the C plus or to the CPU implementation of WS Clean, so it's not completely fair, but we get a pretty good speed up with our algorithm. Um, and then of course we have um, a big effort to develop gigantic cosmological simulations as part of a collaboration between the University of Basel, the University of Zurich, and CSCS um, called SPH-EXA, a framework for smooth particle hydrodynamics and gravity at exascale. Um, these guys are trying to develop the first trillion particle simulation of, ga of galaxy formation with SPH, gravity, and radiation running at exascale. They've already developed and produced some of their first initial simulations with this. And this is another really interdisciplinary project with HPC scientists, astrophysicists, cosmologists, 
and visualization specialists as well. So we already have like a trillion particle um, simulation visualization running at CSCS. Um, and this is just a, a plot of some of the scaling that they've accomplished. So weak scaling, flat means good. It means your code is sort of, it scales out to more and more nodes when you're running it. So what, this is everything that we're sort of currently working on in all of these projects. Why MWA? Well, it's probably to no one's surprise that we're interested in the EOR. Um, obviously, this is a really, really interesting science use case, you know, trying to understand the very early stages of galaxy formation in the cosmic dawn. Um, we do have a team working in the science data challenge number three for the SK right now, so I thought it would just be interesting to show some of the in-progress work for what the team is working on in terms of what we can bring to MWA. So we have a full mock observation pipeline set up at the moment, so simulating 21 centimeter cubes um, and creating full mock observations, including galactic foreground, primary beam, and point sources from the Glean catalog, running things through WS Clean to make the dirty images, adding ionospheric effects, adding various uh, DI gain error, red noise, and other effects, and then, you know, finally creating your sort of ground truth and um, output images reflecting a real observation. So this complicated pipeline for trying to create mock observations. Um, and then also working on some machine learning to actually try to do the foreground removal and identifying the 21 centimeter source using this mock pipeline. So with two neural networks, one does segmentation, so just trying to identify regions that it thinks are ionized. And then a second neural network that's doing the sort of denoising and recovering of the 21 centimeter signal, so a regression network in that sense. And in the preliminary results right now, because I mean the data challenge is ongoing, it's working pretty well. So this plot on the uh, left here is just the output of the segmentation network. So looking at uh, what fraction, and I guess it's coded by redshift, the blue to the yellow, uh, what fraction of, you know, how accurately do you pre predict the um, reionization fraction in the, in the volume that you're predicting? So it does a pretty good job. That contour is the 95% contour. Um, and then for the 21 centimeter recovery, um, let me try to get the razor pointer working. Nope. Okay. Just point. That'll be fine. Uh, the Sariat predictions, sort of the foreground contamination in our, in our simulated image is sort of showing in orange. So after the foreground subtraction, the um, identification of the ionization region, the 21 centimeter extraction, we get the, our predictions in these red crosses, which is pretty good compared to our simulated truth, which is shown in blue. So very nice performance so far. Um, and then, of course, um, observations of the sun are very, very interesting. So we have actually a, a pretty large collaboration of different groups since what's really into are interested in heliophysics. So ETHZ, FH, and W, Aerosol, and also the University of Bern. At the moment, the group who's part of the MWA collaboration representing the interest in solar physics is FH and W, but we hope to possibly engage some additional groups as well. And obviously, this is interesting for lots and lots of reasons. You know, it's solar flares, magnetic tomography, looking at plasma heating or coronal heating, coronal turbulence, and particle acceleration not to mention all of the interesting stuff related to space weather. The particular interest of FHMW, though, um, is to do multi-wavelength diagnostics with MWA. Um, so, you know, trying to do simultaneous X-ray or radio observations, because this especially has synergy with the STIX solar orbiter observation. So if you're interested in that, actually, Rohit from FHMW is here. If you're interested in talking a little bit more about that, you can just find him at the coffee break. Yeah, there we are. Um, then, of course, we also have groups that are interested in galaxy formation and evolution. Um, a lot of this is driven by Mark Sargent and Izzy Byrne, but also Jean-Paul Knebe at ETFL um, and Lucio Meyer at the University of Zurich, trying to do multi-frequency spectral modeling of low redshift star-forming galaxy populations, hopefully combining MWA data with data from other wide area surveys, such as Foremost. Um, and then Mark is very interested in doing low frequency radio emission as star formation rate tracer, looking at radio AGN variability, and then also trying to study high redshift AGN galaxies in their environment. Um, and then finally, we also have a, a small group at EPFL working on the Cherenkov Telescope Array. So this is this gamma ray observatory. Um, and they would are interested in possibly using MWA to do multi wavelength analysis of quasars. So combining the CTA data or some of the precursor data with MWA observations. Um, and then finally, in terms of technical interests at EPFL and CSCS, we're obviously very interested in high performance computing. 
And this is, you know, a major challenge for radio astronomy. I think this paper is great. I tend to put it in all my slides about HPC, uh, about, you know, the imperative to reduce carbon emissions in astronomy, where you just see how big um, supercomputing is in terms of power consumption. You know, even if we ignore the carbon and the environmental impact, that power consumption is quite expensive. A big chart of, chunk of that is from simulations, and a big chunk of that, of course, is from radio astronomy data reduction. But an important thing to keep in mind is that, you know, in terms of the power consumption of your system, what matters a lot is, you know, better flops per hardware. And uh, this is just uh, rank 9 and 10 from the top 500, so this ranks of the best supercomputers in the world. And I'm being a little unfair here because number 10 is slightly older, I think two years older than Celine. But even with, you know, um, you can get basically slightly better performance or much better performance with drastically less power. So these two machines have, you know, quite similar at the end, sort of peak measured peak performance in terms of flops. Um, but Celine uses like almost a tenth of the power that um, Chanhe 2A uses. So using GPUs, using lower power accelerators is quite interesting for this. So what we're interested in doing um, at EPFL uh, is doing performance tuning for radio astronomy workflow. So this includes code refactoring, GPU accelerating, benchmarking, and so on and so forth. But also trying to look towards energy efficient computing. So energy monitoring, and we have a lib power sensor library that people have been using for monitoring the power consumption of their cosmological simulations to great effect, and optimizing for energy solution. So this is just an example of two projects that we've worked on. Um, so um, Etienne Orlac, one of our engineers at EPFL, was just doing some of the refactoring um, part of the blue build code, in fact, that imaging code, comparing the original Python implementation and then the GPU and CPU implementations, and we didn't get an order of magnitude, well, two orders of magnitude speed up, in fact, it's a very nice result. Um, and then Stefano Corda, I mean, if you ever run image domain grading IDG on AMD GPUs, you can thank Stefano for doing the whole HIP implementation. Um, but before that, he was doing all of this benchmarking. So V1, V2, V3 are just different parts of IDG. And then she's just looking at the performance according to different benchmarks. So gigaflops per second, mega visibilities per second, mega visibilities per joule for the energy consumption. Um, and then just looking at the different, different um, GPUs, so NVIDIA V100, A4000, A100. And we see, funnily enough, that so A100 will give you the best performance in terms of time to solution. You can process the most visibilities per second. But in fact, NVIDIA V100 will give you the best energy performance. You can process the most visibilities um, per joule. So an interesting trade-off, and hopefully this will inform the co-design of the SK in the future. Um, and then finally, um, we also have universities, so ETH Zurich and FHNW, working on digital twins. Um, and there's this new software package that they've put out called Carabo which we've mostly been using so far for SKA digital twins, but could also be really interesting if applied to MWA. So this is a software distribution for validating and benchmarking radio telescopes and algorithms. It's quite easy to get installed and get running. It uses Docker containers and Docker images to kind of put together all of these different components of your pipeline. So, you know, you get your Gleam survey, you have your instrument simulation, you sort of make your mock image using WS Gleam. You run whatever algorithm you use part of your scientific analysis, then you do, you know, visualization or whatever else you need to do as this kind of easy way to distribute and combine to the different, different packages. Um, so at the, we, they are very interested in including MWA data sets for, for testing and making mock data surveys. Um, and this is just a list, I'm not going to say all of these out loud, but just a list of some of the different packages that are included. And so far, it's a very nice sort of mock simulation generation. Um, and model system noise, primary beam, ionospheric screen, um, and then also there's support for longer observations, line emission, source detection, parallelization, big catalogs. We've been using it a lot for all of our like image algorithm generation and benchmarking stuff for making mock um, SKA observations, for example. Um, and yeah, they've been using it as part of the Science Data Challenge 3 for some of these EOR studies and mock, mock um, generations. So in conclusion, we are on the path to joining the MWA. Um, we're interested in joining the MWA because there's a lot of alignment and synergies with several other projects in Switzerland, and we're looking to contribute with our expertise in high performance computing, digital twins, cosmological simulations, data science, and then, of course, with astrophysics and cosmology. So thanks for your attention, anyone. Are there any questions?
Thank you, Emma. That you covered a lot of ground. Well done, Sam. Thanks. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, first one up real quick. You just mentioned that there's an AMD a version of IDG. Mm -hmm. um, how do I get a hold of that? <laughs> I think it's a, let me check with Stefano. I think it's like on the, it's a fork of the main IDG branch. Brilliant. But yeah. Okay. Um, and second, I am very interested in seeing your backup slides for the, um, <laughs> for which one? For uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, it was blue, that's right. Blue build. That's blue right, build. Yeah. Okay, great. I knew I put this in for a reason. So, this, I mean, blue build was developed in collaboration with some signal processing scientists who are used to like writing out some of the nomenclature for what we do in terms of imaging in a slightly different way. So, bear with me while I go through all of this. Um, but we have, and we're going to be putting out a paper soon that kind of puts all of these equations in one document and explains exactly what's going on. But this is the general idea. I mean, obviously, we know that the telescope is actually recording voltages. Of course, these voltages are a function of the you know, actual signal that's in the sky, which is this S. Um, and then the gains and then the spy term is just the phase delay term. When we construct visibilities, this is the correlation between the voltages, which if we choose to be very terse and concise, like a mathematician, we can just kind of mash together all of these different terms for the gain and for the phase delay as the psi, which is essentially the sampling operator. So it ultimately acts like a Fourier transform, except not exactly the, the fast Fourier transform. And then we write this in this simplified notation where we say, okay, the visibilities are this, what I'll call this sampling operator operating on my, my image of the sky, which is sort of the ex expected value of the uncorrelated emission in the sky. Um, then, you know, what we want to do is try to solve for B, you know, we have the voltage or we have the visibilities, that's fine, but I, you know, I want to know what is actually creating these kinds of visibilities. So you use the pseudo inverse um, operating on these matrices to try to reconstruct what the, your best reconstructed value of V. This is guaranteed to solve the least square solution. And then typically the way that you go from this to the traditional Fourier transform is you say this matrix, the pseudo inverse term, I'm just going to make that a diagonal. I'm just going to set it to the identity matrix, ignore all, all off diagonal terms. Um, I'm going to, you know, ignore the W term and, you know, set that to zero. Uh, and you do, and then it, with that approximation, um, and additionally saying, oh, well, it's not just visibilities and voltages, but it's sampling of the UV plane, you get to the traditional, um, and this is just the DFT operating on the visibility plane, but the sort of typical equation that we use for imaging. Um, so blue build, the motivation for this was trying to create something imaging on the sphere that was like possibly a bit more correct. So we get away from just diagonalizing what we call the gram matrix, these pseudo inverse terms by doing functional principal component analysis. So the idea is you say, okay, I have my best reconstructed image of the sky. I'm going to say that I can reconstruct some, um, I can do some kind of eigenvalue decomposition of this, where I have these eigenvectors, these epsilon terms, and the corresponding eigenvalues. And I'm just going to say I'm going to, you know, this is what I'm going to want to create, but I want to try to pick this such that when psi operates on these epsilons, it it basically, or when psi operates on some other vector, these these a's, it'll give me the epsilon. So you basically reconstruct your decomposition such that the Fourier transform will reconstruct your eigen images or eigenvectors from that. Um, and so what you get is you have your, that your image is actually the Fourier transform just of this sort of modified um, visibilities, which you can see is very, very similar to this operation here, where these modified visibilities are reconstructed from these other eigenvectors. And these eigenvectors solve this generalized eigenvalue problem. So essentially you have all of these inputs, you know, you have your visibilities, you can easily calculate this gram matrix. It's just the sampling operator operating on itself. So you solve this general, you do eigenvalue decomposition, and this is quite small because it's a number of antenna. Um, and then you sort of create your modified visibilities from that. And then you just need to apply, and we apply the non-uniform fast Fourier transform here because we're mapping to non-uniform to non-uniform space. Um, and yeah, we end up getting pretty nice performance. What it looks like in terms of images, these are like the original visibilities. I think this is like a mock LOFAR data set that we're using here. Um, I'm just choosing to reconstruct this as four different um, eigen images. So we did the PCA. This is what the eigen visibilities end up looking at. Like, so these are the A vector terms. Uh, and then you just apply, you know, the NU FFT, not just FFT here. 
and then you reconstruct your image in different energy levels. And what's interesting is this is an image with true four Gaussian sources that we've just put in. There's like a factor of 1000 difference in flux between the brightest source, which you can see in the combined image and the dimmer sources. But because you do this energy level decomposition, you kind of get each source separated out into different energy levels. And this is without any cleaning at all. You know, we don't have any additional regularization. Um, back a little bit. You can still see each source. Uh, when you combine them, of course, you really can't see any of the dimmer sources in the image. So we also have a PhD student who's working on this for solar observations just to see how useful it would be in the diffuse emission context. Um, so he's created this simulation of um, a solar observation, run this through, sorry, I'm having a hard time with the arrow bright keys today, um, run this through Caribou to create a mock observation, so then image that with WS clean, and you can see, okay, well, and again, this is without any cleaning in WS clean, so we're just using like the W projection to do the reconstruction. Um, and then the corresponding image with blue bold least squares is very, very consistent. So least squares, you just apply the energy eigenvalues, you sum all the images together, it's very consistent. We fixed this slight order of magnitude difference in the most recent bit limitation as well. But then you have more than just this, you also get the image kind of exploded out in terms of different energy levels. Um, and you know, you have your, um, sort of level one, the brightest stuff is kind of this sort of blobby diffuse emission, but then um, potentially you're also recovering some of the diffuse structure, substructure from the images we can see here. And then in level three, which is mostly combined with noise. Um, so yeah, so quite interesting stuff. Um, if anyone's at URSI in Sapporo, Japan this summer, Shram Krishna will be presenting this then. And um, if anyone wants to come to the Swiss SK days in Switzerland in September, um, we'll probably give an update on the status of Google then as well. Mm -hmm. cool. Sorry, that was your second mini talk for free. Yeah. Uh, maybe time for a couple more. Yeah. I'll ask a question about this and then I'll ask a question about your, the rest of your talk. Um, how does this perform in a low signal to noise ratio regime where often these types of uh, algorithms can, can fall down? So it's, it'll be perfectly consistent with WS clean from what we've seen. So it may be that like some of the separation that it's doing in this eigen level sub sense doesn't quite make sense, but it's still imaging on the sphere. Like it is not doing any kind of approximation of the W term here. So potentially if you're doing wider field of view uh, imaging, it can be quite useful for you. But yeah, then it's possible. And we haven't tested it yet on like something that's super, super noisy, but it's true that then you're going to have like, just like we see here, you're going to have like a lot of mixing between the signal and noise and the lowest um, yeah. eigen level. So it might not be super useful in that case. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. That's really exciting. Okay, wearing my, my EOR hat now, um, very excited about the complementary skill set that you can bring to the EOR collaboration. Uh, I'm interested in whether you have um, radio obser observers also in the Swiss consortium who'd be interested in, in getting into the real details of the data as well. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, that's definitely, I mean, one thing that we really want to do is to sort of cut our teeth on real radio observations. Um, and we have a few new groups that are coming up. Um, I mean, Mark Sargent is a good example of one who have experience in doing this kind of rate of reduction. And yeah, we're definitely interested in sort of transitioning from these kind of simulations, idealized situations to actually doing real data reduction. Uh, oh, a simple one and a hard one. <clears throat> the simple one is you showed this uh, incredibly impressive collaboration of all the institutes in Switzerland. Can you just comment on the size of Switzerland compared with the Murchison Radio Observatory? <laughs> what, you mean as a nation or as Have a you put it on the map? It's about the same, I think, right? Oh, you mean in terms of, that's a really good question, actually. I mean, Switzerland's quite small. Off yes. the top of my head, I couldn't, I couldn't do that for okay. you, unfortunately. Uh, so, 6K <laughs> is cool. Well, yeah, something like this to this, quite small. No, the lake is way bigger. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> my my hard question, which is really a comment for later discussion, throughout the development of SKA and especially since we've had the EOR objective, uh, there's been fabulous modeling of the kind you described of what the signals will look like, but there has been a conspicuous gap between people who understand the instrument and people who understand the universe. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't see in your modeling anything related to 
the real issues, which are band passes and side loads and all of this kind of stuff. We, the plan is to try to add that, in fact, to this instrument simulation. But I mean, I think a big part of what we hope to get out of the MWA collaboration is like a better idea of like the particular instrumentation issues that MWA deals with. I mean, we've been working a lot on um, a lot of these machine learning things, and we basically find that it really depends on how good your instrument simulation is in terms of how robust it is to different effects. Um, but definitely trying to put in to try to work with everyone here to try to develop more realistic models of the instrument is something we're very keen on doing. There's something cultural about the theorists not wanting to tackle these other problems. A, a gap arises. No, I, I definitely see. We find that actually in lots of different domains. I mean, this is slightly different, but it's been a major challenge for like this blue build algorithm project where there's a huge gap between the mathematicians who developed the original algorithm. And then it turns out it's very complicated to actually make things work for all different measurement set formats. and um sort of dealing with the coordinate transforms ends up being a very sort of complicated messy thing um i think it's just trying to trying to bring together those different domains of expertise like is a major goal of the the sketch consortium in switzerland and like a lot of these different radio astronomy projects in switzerland so yeah i definitely i definitely see where you're coming from but it is it is a gap that we're sort of hoping to at least attempt to bridge as part of this Cool, thank you again, Emma. Let's uh, thank Emma and Ronnie again for this presentations this morning. Okay, hello. So let's get started. Hello. Okay, please have a seat. Okay, uh, so let's begin our the first uh, science session in the morning. So first session is on the EOR, and our first speaker in session is Professor Catherine Trout. Catherine, please. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Catherine Trout, and I'm a faculty member here at ICRO Curtin University. I'm the current EOR spokesperson, so I'm going to be giving the overview talk. Now, like the other uh, spokespeople for the collaboration, um, we were asked to provide a 10 year retrospective of our project. Uh, and so I'm going to do my best um, to, to attempt that. Uh, most of the input from this is, is my personal input. So some people might have different recollections, but I do have some photos that have been provided um, by different people. I, I really like this photo. I'm not sure who took this photo, but um, I really like this photo and I use it as the start of most of my talks within Astro 3D when I'm talking about SKA. And the reason I like it is because I think it really shows just what the site is actually like and that this is land that's very ancient. It's been there for a very, very long time. Um, and, and the Wadjuri Amaji are, are kindly allowing us to place our technology upon um, this land. But in 50 years when we have, uh, we've had the, the, the SKA and it will be decommissioned after its, uh, after its lifetime, this land will, will go on and it will still look the same. And so I, I really like that. Okay, so what is um, the MWA EOR? Um, well, it's this, it's these people. And, and this isn't all of the faces. These are all the names that came to me that I tried to pull down photos for. Um, the nice thing about this is that we're about to bring on a huge number um, of new um, members, not only hopefully from our Swiss um, uh, Swiss co collaboration members, but also thank you very much to, to Kathy for bringing along of her, a lot of her Chinese colleagues, the junior um, members of, of Kathy's group who have learnt at our EOR Busy Day on Monday about the project and are going to be really jumping on board with some of the data processing and a lot of the work that's going to be done. So th this, this, these faces will grow and I hope that that continues in the future. Um, within the MWA EOR collaboration, there are probably four countries that are really highly active within, within EOR. And that's Australia, United States, China, and Japan, and they're all represented here today. And so I'd like to thank those people for all the work they've put in. And if you combined the, the number of hours that the people on this slide have spent thinking about this experiment and trying to extract that one EOR, as Stephen said, um, out of it, it would be tens of thousands of hours. And, and I really mean that quite truthfully. This is a hard project. Okay, so where do we sit globally? Um, just as, as a reminder of where this field is. So, this is sort of the suite of instruments broadly, it's not all of them, of course, um, that have or are um, working in cosmic dawn and epoch of reionization science and looking for that 21 centimetre signal. So those brightness temperature fluctuations 
of the 21 centimetre line in the early universe, whether in absorption or in emission against the CMB or your favourite radio background. Uh, so LOFAR, HERA and the MWA, the ones that I have um, placed those squares around there, they're the ones that are, that are principally um, very highly active, particularly in the, the, the reionisation epoch. So I'd call that redshifts five and a half to 10, really redshifts six and a half to 10 in terms of the observational space. Um, and some of them are then working at higher redshifts. So and we know, for example, that NEMUFAR um, has a higher redshift limit that they're about to release. LOFAR is about to release a new limit that a lot of us have seen. Um, and, and HERA's um, also working uh, you know, on new limits as well. Um, having Kathy here this week, we've been talking about 21 CMA, um, which is no longer taking data for the EOR, but has in the past. And so there's going to be a lot of shared learning between the MWA and 21 CMA so that we can try and extract some information out of, out of that data set. So that's a really excellent connection. So maybe that'll have a box around it soon as well. Uh, and of course, the, the SKA, and I looked after I sent these slides through for the second time, I realised that photo is so out of date for the SKA. And thank God we don't have concrete um, bases anymore. Um, okay, so from a, a redshift space point of view, um, this is broadly where the different uh, types of instruments and telescopes sit. So the, the red and the green um, box there are really in the cosmic dawn or the epoch of X-ray heating after those first stars form and start to heat the medium. And you see that signal at the bottom there start to go from absorption up into emission. That's the point when reionization starts, we think. And by that, I mean that those brightness temperature fluctuations and now not dominated by the change in the spin temperature of the 21 centimetre line, but, but dominated by the difference between the ionised regions where there's just no signal and the regions where it's still partly neutral and therefore it is signal. And that's the dominant signal that we look for in the reionisation experiment. So principally, we've worked from redshift 7 to 10. Um, once you go to higher redshifts and lower frequencies, things just become harder. Your beam on the sky becomes bigger. The ionosphere becomes more active the sky becomes hotter, the experiment gets harder and harder. But nonetheless, a lot of people have tried to work around that redshift 17 to 18, and that's all because of the edges result that came out in 2018 that really spurred the community to say, well, look, we've got data down there, let's have a look. Um, so I don't, um, I don't, haven't got a reference on this slide. I apologise to Nicole, because it's from Nicole's paper. Um, and I've ad added things to it, because this field keeps changing. You have to keep adding more and more um, uh, 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 symbols to it. But, but broadly, this is where the, 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 uh, the observational um, program sits across the different telescopes, different redshifts, different angular modes. There's a lot that goes into this plot. There's apples, there's oranges, there's peaches, there's nectarines. They're all in there together. Um, and we try and put on a plot that's really not representative. But the general idea I want to show you here is we're nicely kind of floating above where we think the signal is at all redshifts, which is a bit, um, which is unfortunate. But that if you look at the progression in time, we're going from the top and we're going down. And, and that's the most important thing, but we're probably not there yet, but we don't actually know exactly what we're looking for. And so this is one of the exciting parts of the project, but also one of the more difficult parts of the project. Okay, so just, um, we had some beautiful talks um, yesterday in particular that had some really nice pretty pictures. Um, Shanoa's talk, the GEG talks, these ones are always really good. EOR is always devoid of pretty pictures, and I apologise for that. You're going to get plots, and if you're lucky, you'll get something 2D and colourful like this, but you're probably going to get some 1D as well. It's a bit boring. What we, what we want is on the left here, okay? This is what the 21 centimetre line looks like if we could image it as a function of redshift and therefore as a function of um, depth into the universe. Um, that's very difficult to do, that tomography experiment's what we hope to do with the SKA. We can know even with the SKA, we'll only be able to do it in reionisation. We're not even going to try it for cosmic dawn. Um, but instead, we look at the power spectrum space, and that's because the variance of the signal on different scales is where most of the information is. We can learn a lot of astrophysics about the universe by just looking at that variance. And so the right-hand side there is the power spectrum. We've got scales on the um, angular scales on the sky in the, the x-axis, so large scales on the left, um, small scales on the right, and then line of sight scales uh, along the vertical axis. And this is a, um, a simulation of what we expect to see. So this doesn't have any foregrounds or anything in it. But with the MWA, because it has a wide field of view, this means it's on the left. Great, there's a lot of signal further to the left. 
but because it has a wide field of view, it also makes the foreground go up. And so that means that our parameter space gets shrunk. And so there are trade-offs in how you design an experiment, um, an instrument to do this particular experiment. And I'll come to that a little bit later, but this is what we're gonna be looking at. We're looking at power on spatial scales on the sky. So quick, um, a couple of slides on LIFAR and HERA so we can place um, where the other instruments are going. Um, 2020 was the last LOFAR um, actual publication, but as I said, their, their new results have been presented at many conferences. The LOFAR project is very much like the MWA project in the sense that this is a general purpose telescope. It does a lot of different science, does a lot of similar science to the MWA, and it does it in the Northern Hemisphere. It has some differences. Its stations are bigger. It has some longer baselines. It doesn't have that high surface brightness sensitivity that, that the MWA does. It doesn't have that beautiful snapshot UV coverage that the MWA does to have that snapshot imaging. However, um, it's otherwise very, very similar. They, have ch they face the same challenges that we have as a project um, over the years, and their new results are about a factor of two, I'm going to say, just in broad terms, better than, than what they have here, which is sort of the way that we've also evolved over the same time scale. So LOFAR is very much sort of matching the MWA in that respect. Now, HERA is a very different type of um, telescope. This is a telescope that is built to do this experiment. Anything else it does, well, that's great. But it's designed to do an experiment. It's not designed to do general science. And so it's designed very, very differently. Um, it's all redundant baselines. It only points up and watches the sky transit overhead. Uh, it, it approaches its data processing in a very different way due to that and has very different challenges. Some of the challenges, of course, are the same but it's taking a very different path to LOFAR and MWA. And so we can learn from each other. And, and HERA has learned a lot from MWA LOFAR paper about how to design an experiment and what you do and don't need to do. So it published some results in 2021. And again, in 2022, um, they, these are quite deep limits. You see they've gone to slightly higher redshift. If you look at their results, there's a lot of fields on the sky where their results are pretty rubbish. And there's, there's one or two fields where things are looking nice and those are the results that you see. But nonetheless, it's not like everything is, is beautiful in Hera land either. There's, they're really having to sift through their data and just get that right um, space in the sky, those right RFI conditions, that right calibration with their redundancy in order to be able to produce these results. So in 2022, they put out another limit paper where they brought those limits down. These are probably still the most competitive in the field to date. Um, and obviously they're still working on increasing their data. The one thing that did come out of this, and I'm not going to talk too much about this because I know Stu's going to talk about it in his talk, but one of the biggest transitions that we've had in this space over the last few years is the move from, oh, we're publishing some upper limits, isn't that nice, to we can do some astrophysics because these limits are now competitive enough that with some modelling we can rule out models of the early universe. So we don't need a detection to be able to do astrophysics. And that's very exciting. It's true with the MWA, it's true of LOFAR, and Stu's gonna talk a little bit more about that. And then a higher redshift, um, there've been some results. You'll notice these are all 2019, 2020, after the EDGES result came out. So there's kind of a flurry of activity um, up at those higher redshifts. Very, very difficult experiment. These limits are all very, very high. Um, but NENUFAR is about to produce their first limit, which is very exciting. Okay, so this is kind of the current state of MWA limits in a slide. And I'm gonna take you into a much more granular level into what these actually look like. But um, th these sort of the, a lot of papers that have been released over the last uh, two or three years that have taken sort of the best data sets, the best analysis that we have and produced um, limits. And most of those limits are at redshift uh, six to 10, but uh, Shintaro Yoshiro, who's here in the room, up the back, thank you Shintaro, and um, Bart Pindor um, decided that they were gonna go after edges as well. And so they went and they used the MWA data um, to place some limits at redshift 15 and also I think at redshift 17. That is a very, very challenging experiment because at those redshifts, the MWA sees pretty much the whole sky. Um, very, very difficult experiment, but, but nonetheless, these were very competitive in the field. Okay, so let's take a step back. We're supposed to be doing a retrospective. So I'm gonna talk for a few slides about results publications as a start, right? This is the tip of the iceberg of what we spend our time doing. Like how much time do we spend actually producing limits on our data? A diminishingly small amount. We spend it doing all the other stuff. So I'm just gonna 
take you through the tip of the iceberg results, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the enablers. So progressing from the bottom to the top, um, 2014 all the way to 2023, and there's clusters of papers. There's clusters of papers at 2016, there's a cluster of papers at 2019, and then there's sort of the, the few that are sort of dribbling out now, and there'll be at least sort of three um, this year, where this year meets the next 12 months. Okay, so let's start at the bottom. So 32T, so we don't have the full instrument at the moment, we've only got 32 um, tiles, but we have data. And so Josh Dillon said, okay, let's give this a crack. Um, we'll have our first go at doing a power spectrum. Now, the numbers on the right aren't very meaningful to you. 10 to the six millikelvin squared is really not competitive. We're down at the 10 to the four millikelvin squared. Now that's where we're trying to work, 10 to the three, 10 to the four. But nonetheless, this was a demonstration of what you could do once you have the start of your telescope. Uh, what this paper really did beyond publishing this is it really started to uncover some of the things that make this project a challenge for the MWA and really for most experiments, but for the MWA in particular. And that's a theme that came through a lot of the limits papers. It's the other stuff in the papers that's really critical and really important here. Um, so jump forward to 2016. So this is now where we've had a couple of years of um, full 128T data. Uh, there's a whole group, a bunch of groups working on that data set. And in particular, we had this something that we called the golden data set. And the golden data set in the sense is like, you know, when you get a shiny coin straight from the mint, and then after 20 years, it's been through circulation, it's been on the ground, it's all dunked, dinged up, and it's it's not gold anymore. The, gold, the golden set was really like that. It's kind of like a dinged up set. So it's still worth the coin's value, um, but it's not quite so shiny because we learned a lot from, well, actually, this data is good, this data is bad, um, et cetera, et cetera. So Aaron Neil Weiss decided EOR is a little bit boring, let's go to higher redshift. He decided to hit redshift 12. These data are all public. You can get all of these um, higher redshift data, um, epoch of X-ray heating. Um, he published um, some really good limits at that redshift, but more importantly, he uncovered some of the other systematics that we had to work with. The effect of the ionosphere and choosing your data very carefully given the conditions of the ionosphere and also the cable reflection. So these are the, the harmonics produced by reflections within the coaxial cables um, from, the, from the instrument itself. And so this is something that we can see in our data. We can still see it in our data now. We know it should be there, but it does take out some of our parameter space that we need to deal with. So the characterization of those cable reflections was one of the big parts that came out of that. Um, Adam Beardsley, who was a PhD student at the time working with Miguel, um, had a, uh, a larger suite of data that he looked at, so I think it was about a thousand observations, um, which is about 30 hours of data. Um, and this brought about what is still, I think, unique in this field that the MWA has always done. And one of the reasons why we're one of the only experiments who's never retracted one of our results. And that is pipeline comparison. This is something that we've done throughout our analysis. Someone uses a pipeline, gets a result on some data, someone else with an entirely different pipeline says, okay, I'm gonna use the same data. Let's see what I find. Is it different? Is it the same? Can we be confident that what we're doing is correct? And so this is from Danny Jacobs' 2016 paper. This is a very well-cited paper that talks about the philosophy of the MWA EOR project. And you can see on the top, we're gonna to call it FHD and then into Epsilon. This is um, traditionally the, the Northern Hemisphere approach. Um, pipeline, and then RTS, which is now hyperdrive and into chips with this sort of the southern hemisphere approach, and then mixing and matching. And these pipelines, they all get to a power spectrum, but the way they do it is very, very different. So they really are very dissimilar pipelines, and having that comparison has been hugely valuable for us to learn um, about our techniques, learn about the factors of two that we were getting wrong, um, and make sure that everything's nice and consistent. And that's been throughout the data. Um, and, then, and then here in Australia, we also published a paper in 2016, again, looking at um, a, a large amount of data and sort of producing a, a new way of looking at a power spectrum. So that was a real flurry of activity. But what we, what we found from that was that we, we'd all detected something. It was fantastic. And of course, we haven't detected the EOR. We've detected foregrounds. We've detected problems. So there's no point taking our data into saying, we're just going to integrate more data because all it means is that your thermal noise line comes down and you never get anywhere. So now we have about a three-year gap 
where all of that other work is happening to try to move us forward as a project. We need to take the data that we have, we need to understand it better, we need to analyse it better, otherwise we're not going to get any further. So 2019 through 2023, there's a whole suite of papers that I've listed here that have limits, um, uh, limits that have been published for them. Um, I'm showing results here from Wenyang Li and um, Nicole Barry's 2019 papers. Um, this is the 2019 paper that Nicole just co-won the um, ASA Louise Webster Prize for, so a very influential paper. Um, and this was, uh, for her work at least, very much about taking data that we already had and really improving our cuts on it, really improving our understanding of it and improving the results from that, just from the same data and by understanding it better. And that's work that she's continued. And then Wen Yang Li used our phase two data, so those redundant baselines to be able to do his science. So what are the key features in this era? Um, starting looking at phase two data. Five minutes, oh yeah, okay. Um, um, moving away from an inverse covariance for um, modelling and foreground fitting. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about this if anyone's interested, but really moving towards a foreground avoidance model so we're not overfitting, we're not losing signal, which is a hallmark of some of the other projects at this time. Um, and, and analysis of, of large suites of data and also reanalysis of data. Um, and then here's, here's some, some of the plots from some of the other the papers that, um, that, that I mentioned there. And you can see on the bottom the sort of the hallmarks of what they are. So, Updated, that says 4A model, means 4NAX-A model. Updating our 4NAX-A model, because 4NAX-A is in one of our fields, and obviously that makes a big difference because it's so bright and so structured. Integrating a large amount of data, um, looking at some of the, the systematics that we can, that we can um, assess by looking at our redundant baselines and how redundant they are. And also, again, as I said, pushing to higher redshifts. But as I said, that was just the tip of the iceberg, and really, um, most of the work that is done is the enabling work. And there's a whole set of papers here, and I'm sure there are ones that I've missed, but these are all papers over the years who've done the legwork for what goes into the project. So we've heard about LOBES already um, earlier in the week. So LOBES is available on Data Central. It's public. I was talking to them this morning, just making sure it's all there, ready to go. Data releases one is there. Data release two will be there shortly. Um, that's a very deep, high-resolution uh, sky survey from the MWA of the EOR fields, and that's been used in the data challenge now um, for the SKA to generate that data challenge data. That's our primary uh, sky model now. So higher resolution and deeper, and that means we can do better calibration and also better um, peeling. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things here. Um, Michael Lentz is going to talk about RFI and how important RFI is in our, in our work, and there's also work on the ionosphere. The right there is the, the new hyperdrive calibration software. Um, and then assessing the quality of our data, which is the GIF that you can see in the middle. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But these are all the enablers. This is all the work that has to be done to actually get to that one ELR, as Stephen talks about. Okay, so that's just that again. I'm going I'm to skip through that because I've already shown that. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of things. Um, so one of the big pieces of work that's been done, and this has been led here in Australia, is to... Uh, uh, look at our data in a really systematic way and try and take it through every step of the calibration and methodology pipeline. And at every step, what can we do to look at the data? What can we do to classify it, to test it, to see if there's something wrong with it? And so this whole suite of uh, metadata and quality metrics, and there's about 20 of them, there's, there's more than this, that Redeemer and Dev and Chris are looking at to take all of our data and really get down to the nitty gritty so that we can ensure that we're using the best data to go into our power spectrum, um, the, the eventual you know, integration for our power spectrum. And so all of this is leading into um, some work that will come out sometime in the next 12 months. And looking to the future, one of the things that this field is going to be doing, which is really exciting and something the MWA is well placed to do given its wide field of view and its, its resolution, is um, the cross-tracer studies. It doesn't necessarily mean cross-correlation, but these are, these are a lot of um, instruments and telescopes coming online now that are going to be looking at carbon monoxide, they're looking at C2, they're looking at Lyman Alpha, they're looking at O3. Euclid's going to tell us where lots of quasars are. Um, and the line intensity mapping experiments and the 21 centimetre experiments are very well matched to each other. 
Uh, and in fact, one of our EOR members who is from Switzerland, who's Hamza um, Padmanaban, she is a theorist. She's heavily involved in a lot of these projects. She's really keen for us to do this cross tracer type work that will also help with our experiment. All right, so a couple of um, photos. This one's courtesy of Stu. Uh, you can see what the old dipoles used to look like. If you want to know why the dipole changed from that to the one we have now, don't ask me. Maybe ask, maybe ask Randall or even Stephen. <laughs> um, um, here's, uh, you yeah, know, this is where bad dipoles go to die. And uh, I think this is karaoke, karaoke going on on the right hand side um, from the group. And of course, the people, busy weeks, uh, side trips, lots of getting together, lots of scratching our heads. And here is an example of this. So this is Miguel on Monday at one of our busy day, our busy day, writing down all the things that we wanted to talk about. So, you know, we're not done yet, basically, is what this slide is, is saying. We've still got a lot to work on and a lot to do. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly talk about this and then I'll conclude. Um, this is now my personal view wish list. And this is how I would like to design an EOR experiment, EOR Cosmic Dawn experiment. Um, from what I've learned over the past few years. And you might look at this and say, oh, but we have this, we don't have this, we don't have this. This is not supposed to be any sort of, oh, the MWA does this and it doesn't. That's not the point of it. These are the things that we've learned are important in this experiment. And there are challenges for different telescopes in this, in this space. Um, you want your stations to be five metres at the smallest, 30 metres sort of at the largest, but you can push to 40 with the SKA, but don't let them get bigger than that. Um, and that's because you need to have wide fields of view, which are really important for your survey, for your sky model, but they make it difficult to do EOR because you get all the rubbish coming in from the side. And so having a smaller field of view is good. You want a nice smooth band pass, um, coax cables, keep them nice and short. Um, if you can beam shape after the fact, because you have digitized dipoles, that also helps you to control some of those systematics. That's something we will have with SKA and we're looking into now. Um, you want your beam to be um, smooth and um, spatially and spectrally smooth, but really you want it to be stable. You want it to be calibratable. If you can calibrate something, you're good, all right? Um, and the zenith beam of the MWA is beautifully stable, so that's great. We love using that. Um, the rest of them are sort of a little bit more obvious. The only thing I'm going to say here is about baselines, 15 metres to 50 kilometres. In the cosmic dawn, you need those 50 kilometres for your sky model. In the EOR, they can be brought back. You don't need them that long, but that's one of the reasons why the SKA um, baselines are quite long. Um, and don't stick your difficult sources down in your beam. All right, so I will, I will conclude <laughs> now that you're standing up. All right, so we all want Stephen's one EOR, I promise we. <laughs> we are working hard towards this. What are our foes? The ionosphere is definitely a foe. Um, because it makes peeling the, the foregrounds out of our data difficult. Um, this is something we're working on very actively now. Even with ionospherically quiet data, it, it's in there, so we need to deal with that. RFI is likely a very big foe. Mike Walensky will talk more about this. Narrowband, broadband, it's the faint stuff that we're, that we're, that's difficult to detect that we're trying to work out how to deal with at the moment. Um, galaxy near the horizon. Yeah, don't look when galaxies near the horizon, that's really ugly. Where are our friends? Phase three, smooth band pass. We are looking forward to that. End-to-end -end simulations. This is somewhere the Swiss can come in. And, um, and we also have our current simulation suite to really test what we're doing. Um, efficient calibration that's easy to use, and that's what we get with hyperdrive. A fringe stopping correlator, which I think will actually be quite valuable for our data. Um, and 256T, so that we can have calibration and EOR goodness all together as one happy family. So this is how we get all these things, and this is why they're here nicely in green. Um, our metrics um, help us with the ionosphere. Also having those long and short baselines at the same time will help that. Johnny Pober's group is working quite hard on a lot of different approaches to RFI. And in the 2023 proposal, we're likely not to have the galaxy above the horizon in our um, request for time because we just know that doesn't work. Looking forward to new receivers. Um, and we're excited about MWAX, and with 256K, um, T will have our cake and eat it. And of course, all of our wonderful people. And I know I'm way over time, so I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Cass, for your very good talk. Uh, two minutes for two questions, minutes. still. Yeah. Yes, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, excellent wish list.
Um, I didn't see anything on there about um, what the ideal antenna type is or what a good frequency range for an EOR telescope is. Oh, I can, okay, I, I can answer those very specific questions. Um, the simplest beam is the best beam. Uh, and so wearing my MWA EOR hat and not wearing my SKA hat, um, a, if you are just going to do this experiment, then something like the MWA dipole is, is, is quite good. I mean, it still has its features, um, but the MWA dipole is quite good. If you could randomise it in your station um, and make it a little bit more like EDA2, then that, that, that would work well. Um, and, and, and also, obviously, we don't need to go to 350 megahertz for this experiment. We'd be happy to chop off at about 200. Uh, so if the SKA was just doing EOR Cosmic Dawn, you would design it differently. But it's a general purpose instrument like the MWA, and so those are the trade-offs. We're happy to have up to 350 because that helps us with our foreground modelling, but obviously it's not necessary for our science. But a simpler be beam is better for our science. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't have much time, but uh, let's switch to next speaker, Professor Stuart Weiss, and he's online. Hey, Stuart, please share your please share your screen. Just stop sharing mine somehow. Um. <clears throat> okay. Afternoon. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, we need to put that into this. Screen. No problem. Oh, okay, so Sruth, I will give you uh, well some you know, our colleague will give you the warning on the on the the message. Okay, um, I've got twenty including questions. Is that right? And yes. I'll make sure I'm done. Yes. So fifteen okay. plus five. Okay. Thank okay. You. Go ahead. All right. Um, thank you, and thanks to Kath for the introduction. Uh, my name's Stuart Wyeth. I'm really sorry not to have um, been able to come over this week. COVID entered the house over the weekend, and I. Um, I'm, I'm missing out on what is really an amazing meeting and um, great would have been great to see so many old friends. So I, I hope everyone's having a good time there this week. Um, I wanted to give a, a talk about some of the work along that um, has been undertaken at mostly at Melbourne, but also in, in Pisa in Italy um, along the modeling side of things, which is uh, tries to underpin some of our understanding of what the signal is we're trying to measure with the MWA. And this work's really been done in parallel with, um, with the amazing observational program that, that Kath and colleagues have been running with the MWA. And it's really been inspired by um, the progress that, that that team is making towards a measurement of the EOR um, in the next few, in, with phase three, surely, Stephen, I, I think. Um, so I will, <clears throat> I'll just, um, bring us back at the start to talk about what, what we, why, why we think there's an EOR signal and, and what it might signify. So, so, um, we know that the intergalactic medium was cold and atomic at very high redshifts after the recombination era. And we know that it's very warm and well, hot and highly ionized today. And we think that that transition um, is, was the result, or at least coeval with the rise of galaxies, um, including starlight and, and accretion uh, driven ionizing radiation, which, which resulted in this phase transition. So there's a couple of reasons then for wanting to study the EOR. One is to measure that transition. Um, it's the last major transition in the history of the universe, and it's yet to have been measured directly. And so that makes it intrinsically interesting. But if, if it is um, driven by the rise of the first galaxies, then this offers us a new route to, uh, to try and understand some of the properties of those very high redshift sources. So those are the two reasons. And I, I'm going to concentrate in this talk on um, the connection between those two things. So this is a, a short outline. Um, I'll start with, talk about reionization by stars. Um, how we might how we simulate galaxy formation and, and reionization, and then uh, expand a little bit on the work that Kath mentioned from Brad Grigg about what we what constraints we can place on the on galaxies and their properties from MWA at the moment, and 
and then just finish uh, in, with a couple of minutes on what we might see in the future with SKA. So let me start with stars. So I'm going to, so first the empirical um, contribution of galaxies to reionization. So over the last decade in particular, the, the properties and number in particular of high redshift galaxies and their space density has been um, measured uh, more and more accurately. And, and in the bottom right here shows a recent luminosity function. So given some, in, some information about the energy distribution of those galaxies and their number, we can uh, integrate over the luminosity function to evaluate how much ionizing radiation was present in the early universe. And then um, compare that, which is on this top plot, so this cumulative <coughs> plot as you go to lower and lower luminosities and compare that to a level which would result in all hydrogen in the intergalactic medium being ionized. So the typical level, very faint galaxies of around about minus 17 in absolute magnitude, don't provide quite enough radiation to ionize the intergalactic medium, but extrapolating this luminosity function by a couple of magnitudes leads you to a level where you would see enough, um, enough photons being produced per unit time to ionize the intergalactic medium. So this is, um, this is the, the empirical result that, that most radiation required has been seen in the star formation that's observed at high redshift, and it's uh, a smallish extrapolation to, um, to find the rest of it. And that's what JWST is, is doing with many programs at the moment. So we can ask theoretically how that sits within our understanding of um, the formation of structure in the universe. And so the simplest way you can look at reionization theoretically is to um, calculate the rate of change of the fraction of the intergalactic gas that's ionized. And, and that, that rate of change is, a, is an ionization uh, fraction of um, IgM that's ionized minus the fraction that recombines per unit time. Um, and if we think galaxies are responsible for this, galaxies form within gravitationally collapsed structure in the universe, which is a quantity that we can calculate analytically or in numerical simulations. And so if you, if you go through that exercise, you find that, um, that turning about 10% of the collapsed gas into stars and having about 10% of the resulting radiation escape those galaxies provides you with enough energy to reionize the intergalactic medium. So both from a, a theoretical point of view and from an empirical point of view, it's quite natural that stars would have reionized the universe by redshift six, which is, um, which is encouraging. Now, Kath showed plots um, like this, which, which are not uh, spatially smooth. So, so far I've just talked about the average ionization um, but when we look at models, we find that, that we expect the, the distribution of ionization to be highly inhomogeneous. So why is that? Um, and it's related to, to galaxy bias. So I can write my rate equation um, with a, a slightly more uh, complex um, source term. So here what, what's been done is to incorporate galaxy bias. So we know from observations of galaxy clustering that Galaxies preferentially form in regions of the universe which are over dense on large scales, where large scales here is megaparsecs. And you can calculate the rate at which um, structure formation is enhanced in those regions and then redo your reionization calculation as a function of large scale over density. So, that's, so an example of a calculation like that is shown on the left um, here in terms of the brightness temperature relative to average. Um, and you find that, that in low, in underdense regions, the brightness temperature is higher because there's uh, the larger fraction of the intergalactic medium remains neutral in those areas. And so you see this anti-correlation. So overdense regions of the intergalactic medium are reionized first. And because the rate at which structure formation, um, well, the rate at which the bias of the radiation in those overdense regions depends on the um, astrophysics of the galaxies that are producing that radiation, that galaxy evolution should drive um, this, this anti-correlation. And therefore, when you look at a power spectrum, you see um, a, the feature of this galaxy formation in the power spectrum. So there's two things to note here. The first is that 
if you look at the very high redshifts in a model like this, say the yellow curve here, this is proportional to the underlying mass um, power spectrum, mass density power spectrum that you would measure in a galaxy redshift survey, for example. But as you come toward, towards lower redshifts as reionization has progressed, that shape changes dramatically. It produces this shoulder, um, which is the quantity that experiments like MWA are trying to measure at redshifts of six to seven. And the details of the evolution and the shape of these curves encode um, information about the underlying galaxies. So I don't want to talk in detail about how we go about modeling, of, um, but just to show uh, a, um, uh, an example here. So this is, this is a semi-analytic model um, for the formation of galaxies, which assigns, which calculates uh, the evolution of, of a stellar population within each merger tree of a large n-body simulation and couples that with a calculation of the reionization of the intergalactic medium. So a model like this um, can allow us to vary the astrophysics of the galaxy population, see how that compares with the properties of galaxies we observe with James Webb or other telescopes, um, and also make predictions about what the MWA or SKA will see in for the power spectrum of 21 centimeter emission. So the goal is to try and connect those two things. So on the on the galaxy front, um, the the advantage of a semi analytic model versus um, other types of models is that it can be run very fast. So so this is a the result of a an MCMC analysis of um, the the parameters that describe physical quantities like the normalization of the Kennecott schmidt law, um, the star formation efficiency, the, the mass loading factor of supernova winds and so on, that um, as well as the properties of the, um, the dust extinction laws that govern um, the, the, the continuum slope that we see in galaxies. And so, so these are the, the luminosity functions on the right at high redshift um, and the, the continuum slope is a function of luminosity on the left. And so this gives us a an underlying model that agrees with what we see in, in our galaxy populations already and allows us to explore um, what that means in the future for the 21 centimeter signal. So very quickly, um, but in terms of the power spectrum, the fiducial model that I've just shown um, produces a, a 21 centimeter map that looks like this um, with a resulting power spectrum that's shown in the black line here. If you vary the astrophysics at high redshift to make the feedback due to supernova um, in particular much less efficient, then you get more large, more small scale power, less large scale power because the ionized regions are smaller because the sources are less biased. Um, if you make a, a toy model which in which you just only allow large dark matter halos to host stars, then you get um, much more power at the same overall ionization fraction. So this is just an illustration of how the astrophysics um, driving the galaxies uh, affects the, the shape of the power spectrum and its evolution. Now, for observing the 21 centimeter signal, it's not just the ionization structure that's important, but also the, the brightness temperature and, and the spin temperature in particular. And so it's the X-rays that are produced in accompanying the ionizing radiation that are really critical here. Um, and so for that, a much larger in simulation is needed, at least 300 megaparsecs on a side. And this is the work from PhD student Balu Sridhar. Um, he's here to see three different uh, populations for the X-ray or three different um, efficiencies of the X-ray emission. And in the lower right panel, the evolution of the power spectrum amplitude at a particular spatial frequency as a function of redshift. And you see um, that the X-rays change the, evol the, the qualitative evolution and also the amplitude of that, of that signal. Okay, so what about um, the MWA? So this is the plot that, that Kath showed um, from Brad Griggs' work um, <clears throat> in the upper right. So, this is using a, a model called 21 centimeter fast, which is um, a phenomenological model that relates properties of galaxies to their dark matter halos uh, in a parametric way. And you can use that to quickly explore regions of parameter space. So on this panel are 500 different simulations for different combinations of 
of parameters describing escape fraction of radiation, star formation efficiency, um, mass for galaxy formation and, um, and X-rays properties. And there are, all of those models are models that have been, um, that are rejected by at least one of the MWA points. Okay, so no, no acceptable model is plotted on this graph. And the, this, the big corner plot is showing us um, which combinations of parameters are rejected by the MWA. And so in panels where we see both black and orange, um, it, the orange regions are rejected. This is because it's probability of rejection that, that I, I at least find this plot quite hard to interpret. But the thing to zone in on is the fact that all the models are rejected, all the models that are rejected have a combination of, of low X-ray efficiency and therefore the intergalactic medium remains cold at epochs where the MWA is observing um, and also reionization is occurring late so that there's still a lot of atomic gas um, that's cold that's producing the fluctuations at low redshift. So it's this corner of the, of, of the diagram here. And so, so we can ask um, how that compares with the, the realistic, more realistic models, those that describe the properties of high redshift galaxies. So I've brought Balu's model back here in the, in the low right hand corner. And these, we can ask how these um, evolutions of the power spectra compare to the rejected models. So I can approximately place these three models on, on Brad's diagram. Um, and they fall about here. And then look at how that compares with the upper limits from the MWA collaboration and over plot. And so this, this low efficiency X-ray model is the one that's, that's ruled out. But all other properties of that model agree with, with the observations we have of the evolution of neutral fraction with the properties of high redshift galaxies and their number and so on. So you can already see MWA pushing into physically realistic um, observation of physically realistic uh, galaxy populations that are consistent with what else we know about the high redshift universe. And, and Kath's just been hinting at, at new limits um, that are lower here. Okay, in my last minute, um, I'll just talk about the, what we might, how these things might change with the SKA. So if I go back to this same model, so these are uh, high redshift luminosity function and, and what we have about the evolution of neutral fraction can ask um, what, what a fiducial model looks like at high redshift and then compare that in terms of its power spectrum, compare that with forecasts for the SKA um, based on 21 centimeter sense. And you see, you know, in, in, our, in the happy future, we're gonna have these very tight uh, me measurements of the power spectrum. So now we can have a look at a, a similar corner plot, but now we're not trying to reject models, we're trying to measure parameters. And so I don't want to go into the details of this plot, except to show that, that in a Fisher matrix analysis like this, you can see which parameters are going to be degenerate, which ones are not, but we can ask, but uh, we can see that we would expect to constrain the properties that are describing things like escape fraction, star formation efficiency, the normalization on Schmidt law, um, and properties that are driving supernova feedback at the sort of 10% level um, with, a, with 21 centimeter observation. So, and the important thing to note here is that, that whilst we can measure a lot of these things with direct observations of galaxies with, with the JWST, the, a, a 21 centimeter experiment sees the entire population of galaxies, not just those that are bright enough. And so is, is the only way of probing that very faint population. Okay, um, I'll just conclude then. Um, so simulation of galaxies, galaxy formation and reionization uh, does shows the imprint that the galaxies have in the 21 centimeter power spectrum, and we can potentially use that uh, imprint to constrain the properties of galaxies. The MWA is already um, beginning to do that, in particular with respect to the efficiency of um, high redshift sources in the X-ray. Um, and the SKA, uh, one, it, with a, a detection should be able to start to measure aspects of galaxy formation directly from the 21 centimeter power spectrum. Um, and Kath showed these, uh, these two panels. This is a, um, and Randall yesterday mentioned the importance of, of Frank Briggs in the early days. This is, this picture was um, actually the first light with T1 
um, uh, with the Stromlo streamer, which I had forgotten about. But this this spectrum is the that's the first um, uh, observation that was taken, and we think it was the trams on Swanston Street um, was, was likely the brightest source at that frequency on the roof of the physics building. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stuart. Uh, your questions. Oh, hi, Stu. Uh, Ron Eakers here. Thanks hi, Ron. for a great talk. Um, in the, you, all of your, um, your power spectrum estimates are coming from simulations of the H1 images on the sky, the uh, ionization regions. So my question is both to you, Stu, but also to Kath. Uh, in the original SKA concept, it was recognized that with a square kilometer of collecting area, you could measure the EOR in the images directly. That avoids a huge number of instrumental errors. So my question is, why has that ambition apparently disappeared? Why are you not pushing SKA to go to a square kilometer so we can actually detect EOR in the images? Um, I'll, I'll let Kath mostly answer this. I think, I think there is still, um, an ambition to do that. This is a, a, there's a lot less information, I think. Um, but as you say, if you're, you're, if you're not trying to measure, um, a variance then, but you're, you're measuring something, uh, in the images, then, then your, your uncertainties are different, but this is a. What I've shown here is um, an expectation for at least for a foreground removal, but I but idealized foreground removal um, with a with the um, variation in the primary beam for an SKA observation of of this um, figure that shows the underlying um, 21 centimeter signal. So you can see that your the information some of it's there, but it's it's um, even with the SKA. At least as designed for phase one, it's the it's not you're not seeing this directly. So when you take the power spectrum, you get to sum over um, over the the image in a way that that provides a higher signal to noise. Right. But in terms of the ambition for that, I'll ask I'll let Kath answer the current state of affairs. Uh, thanks, Stu. So this is definitely still part of the science case and the five deep fields will be used to do uh, power spectrum and tomography within reionization, not at high redshifts. Um, the modelling suggests that this is still able to be done. We might not have a kilometre of um, collecting, a square kilometre of collecting area, but we still have that very high surface brightness, dense core that if that goes out to five kilometres, which is the, the plan, that gives us the information on those scales. So we still think it's a, it's a doable experiment. Great. So let's thank Stuart for your inspiring talk. Thanks. And our next speaker is Dr. Michael Wielanski. Welcome. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Mike Walensky, and I'm a postdoc at University of Manchester right now. And uh, I don't mean to put a damper on this very nice and happy meeting, but today I'm going to talk about the specter of RFI and uh, what problems potentially very uh, large problems it may cause for EOR science. Um, so the title of the talk is evidence of ultra faint RFI in deep 21 centimeter power spectra. And when I say ultra faint, what I mean is conventionally something that we have to integrate at least 20 or 30 minutes coherently just to see it peak above the noise and the tails of our power spectrum. So this isn't um, the faintest thing that AO flagger catches or the faintest thing that SINS catches, which is an RFI flagger that I wrote to improve on AO flagger. This is really stuff that you have to work very hard to isolate 
um, and, and hunt for and figure out where it is. Um, so I'll start by just uh, talking about why theoretically RFI is a problem in 21 centimeter power spectrum estimation. And then I'll present an RFI study uh, that I did on some 2014 data, some phase one data from the NWA. And I'll talk about the data analysis a bit. I won't be able to get into all the crunchy details, but I'm happy to talk at any point about them with anyone. And then I'll show that a, a, I'll show a power spectrum upper limit that we made along the way. So, uh, of course, we now know that the 21 centimeter signal is very, very faint. And uh, we are using the frequency axis of the data as a line of sight distance axis. Now, why this is important is we believe reionization kind of happened patchwise, uh, as depicted in this simulation that I stole from uh, Pritchard and Loeb, I think. And um, if you imagine drawing like a horizontal slice across the simulation and trying to look for the 21 centimeter signal, you would expect it to have some spectral structure. And this is in contrast to one of our main systematics, which is astrophysical foregrounds, which are very spectrally smooth. So we hope to be able to separate the 21 centimeter signal based on the fact that it has spectral structure where the foregrounds don't. Um, the problem with RFI is that it almost always has very sharp spectral structure, which means that we can't separate it from the 21 centimeter signal in the same way that we can the foregrounds. And so we have to deal with it, um, and it has the potential to be much more pernicious. So this is a simulation uh, that I did the, so I didn't do the black line here. The black line is fiducial theory simulated by Brad Grieg of the EOR signal. It's a fairly optimistic model. The blue and green lines are simulated power spectra from RFI sources, just different types. And um, these, I gave these RFI sources an apparent flux of one millijansky. So how you can interpret this is if you had a one millijansky source in your final coherently integrated image that you made a power spectrum out of, it would be competitive with the EOR on some modes, depending on the frequency structure of the RFI. Now that's not a very good theoretical model of what the RFI content of our final coherent integration is. What's more likely is you have a bunch of sources from a bunch of different snapshots integrated together on the sky, probably incoherently with one another spatially. But you can do a back of the envelope calculation and find that if you have 300 sources and 1,000 snapshots and there are about 60 microjanskys in the final integrated image, it's roughly equivalent to this. Uh, so it's so a very faint RFI can be a very big problem. And uh, we don't have great um, observational handles on how, how good our RFI flaggers are doing and how they perform in deep integrations. And so this work is kind of a, um, an attempt at getting an observational probe on, on how that problem looks. So basic study design is that we took a season of data from 2014 in the MWA EOR high band. Uh, this data is plagued by digital television, which is a moderately broadband RFI source. Um, I at some point wrote a kind of specialized RFI flagger to go find faint TV interference, it's called SINs. I can't talk today too much about how it works, uh, but it, it finds things about an order of magnitude fainter in a single two minute snapshot compared to say AO flagger. <clears throat> so we then uh, run SINs on the data, separate it by its RFI content, and then see if we can find stuff in the power spectrum that are um, different in different subsets and see if we can relate it to whether or not it's likely to be due to RFI. And then finally, we try and see uh, how, how it affects the power spectrum upper limit. So um, okay, that yellow showed up kind of all right. Uh, so this is a, oh, I forgot to mention, I forgot to make a slide on this. Our first clue uh, that RFI might be significant observationally at the integration depths that we're working at right now is the EOR team was in a limit led by Nicole, where she cut a lot of observations that were seen as contaminated by SINs, but not so much as AO flagger, and it, it made a good improvement on some of the limits that were shown in that paper. And so that kind of spurred us to, to think, okay, maybe this RFI stuff is important to get a handle on. So what I've plotted here is the full 3000 observation set that I looked at in 2014. Uh, it's civil time, the date on the vertical axis here, horizontal axis is sidereal time, each point is a two-minute observation. 
the color tells you how many integrations add RFI in them, the fraction of integrations. And uh, what becomes clear if you stare long enough at this plot is that high occupancy observations kind of run in packs. So it seems like RFI tends to cluster in time. And you kind of expect that physically if you know how the RFI is getting into the array. So a lot of the RFI we see, at least in the high band, is reflection off of airplanes and satellites and things. And so um, if you have an airplane that moves through the beam and it takes a bit to move through the beam, then you'd expect a number of integrations to be contaminated. But as it moves to less sensitive parts of the beam, maybe it dives beneath the sensitivity of the RFI flagger and then comes back up again as it hits the peak of a side lobe. So this sort of um, inspires a particular type of jackknife test. So um, thinking being, OK, we've flagged a bunch of observations with SINs, but there's probably more RFI in those observations that SINs missed. And we want to see if we can integrate those observations, which we call absolved observations, because we've absolved them with their SINs. Um, we integrate those together and then compare them to some LST matched observations that SINs said had no RFI, which we call pure observations, do we then see a difference in their power spectra in the EOR window where we expect no foreground contamination? Um, right, so there were a number of different kind of categories of, of uh, a number of axes that we jackknifed down um, in, in this process. The one that had the most obvious pattern was pointing. So I'm showing several uh, cylindrical power spectra on this slide. The top row is uh, made from pure observations, so ones that had no RFI as far as we could tell with SINs. Bottom row are, are absolved LST matched power spectra. And um, from left to right is pointing from east to west. And if you look up in the EOR window, which is above that solid line there where we expect no foreground contamination above it, it looks very noise-like in the pure observations. You see this kind of even speckling of purple and yellow bins. If you look down in the absolved power spectra, you can see that towards the lower left corner of the EOR window, it's very much, um, there's kind of this smooth contamination that looks very signal-like. And so it's very clear that there's, there's something different about the absolved observations compared to the pure observations. It's hard to see on this series of power spectra, but uh, if you look at enough of them, if we looked at a couple hundred, uh, it kind of becomes clear that the more Western pointings are, are worse than the, the more Eastern ones or Zenith. And this sort of makes sense so on the right. I don't consider this exhaustive, but I found a resource that will point out the latitude and longitude of different TV transmitter sites. And they have an effective radiated power of the sites. And I've kind of uh, put it in this qualitative log scale, if you will. And you can see that um, the brightest ones are in Perth down there, and that one way to the south, I don't know which one that is, but then Geraldton is nearby and is about an order of magnitude less in effective radiated power, but, but close, right? The reason I'm bringing that up is we see this signature mostly in the east-west dipoles. We don't really see it in the north-south dipoles. And so if the um, bulk of the residual RFI is coming from things scattering off of those transmitters to the south, you might expect to see it more in the east-west dipoles than the north-south dipoles, just due to basic electromagnetic considerations. Um, so it's, it's a nice picture of what might be going on. Um, just to uh, make it clear that we didn't reason on only a few power spectra, these are just cumulative distribution functions of noise-weighted power spectra, and the lighter colors on this plot are pointings more to the west. And so you can see systematically uh, that there are, in the absolved power spectra, the top panel there, um, more signal-like contributions in the Western pointings compared to if you look at the pure plot. And I won't talk about the difference unless someone wants to ask me about it later. <clears throat> so just to be um, sure that this was actually something related to RFI, we did another jackknife test. Um, so I've made another category here, repentant. So this is an observation that was seen to be contaminated. We know it should be flagged, but we've turned the flags off. Um, and so we took an absolved subset, took its repentant subset, 
they power spectra in difference to them. You can see that on the right. So on the right, we, we, we like to see blue in the EOR window because blue means we, did, we took power out of the EOR window. I mean, we like that to a point. And then um, anyway, uh, <laughs> so, so um, basically that shape there in the lower left of the EOR window is, is what we call the RFI footprint. And we're, we're quite sure it's RFI because, thank you, uh, because it very obviously gets enhanced when we turn the flags off. And, and we use the same calibration solution. So this isn't like we had some sort of calibration error that showed up in the EOR window in this shape. There's, you'll also see that there is some blue in the um, foreground wedge in the side lobes between the dashed and the, the solid black there. And this sort of makes sense if you're taking away TV interference, which has, it's kind of a broad top hat in its power spectral density. So it looks sort of smooth. It has a smooth component, but then it has sharp cutoffs. So the sharp cutoffs throw power high into the window. The smooth component puts power in the wedge. So this, this, um, this seems like strong evidence for RFI being a cause for this signature that we see in our jackknife tests. So, there are some puzzles that we found in the jackknives. So for instance, brighter RFI events in the SINs don't necessarily correlate with worse contamination in the integrated power spectra. There's this kind of funny dependence on integration time where 30 minutes seems to be about the sweet spot in terms of like signal to noise ratio on the RFI. Um, and I think this is related to whether or not multiple nights get combined. I think it's possible that RFI sources are incoherent across many nights, but within one night kind of integrate coherently with each other. Um, and then the different RFI types don't seem to have, so, if, so SINs will tell you, I found TV or I found narrowband or I found broadband. Uh, if, if you really believe that it was TV RFI, you would expect a certain power spectrum shape just based on the shape of the TV and frequency. And what we find is that the power spectrum signature is not really different among the RFI shapes. And so that's a little mysterious. You could maybe explain that by, well, okay, it caught narrowband interference. That doesn't mean there wasn't TV also residual in the observation. But again, this is kind of just tenuous conjecture. We would really want to investigate that further to be sure that that's what's going on. So that's why I've listed it as a puzzle still. <clears throat> so we then decided to make a limit and see how exhaustive RFI cuts might affect our spectrum limit. So uh, one of the first cuts we did, which is a fairly standard cut in the power spectrum analyses we do, is to cut everything that had a bad ionosphere. I actually made this cut very, very harsh because I, I just didn't want there to be any confusion about whether or not it was the ionosphere affecting the limit or, or RFI or something like that. Um, and then we also cut observations if, if an ionospheric metric couldn't be gathered because that's sometimes just a sign of, of poor quality. Um, then we also cut all of the absolved observations. So it, it, with the idea that there's probably residual RFI in them that SINs didn't catch. And then uh, we also did a few more cuts on the pure observations because they seemed to have the RFI footprint in them when we made power spectra out of them. And we just thought, why not try and make the cleanest limit possible and, and see what we get? So we call that final subset the, the wall of shame. Um, right, so here are some deep power spectra. The top are with the east-west dipoles, bottom north-south. The leftmost column is the wall of shame. And you can see that in the east-west dipoles, it has that footprint in it. If you look at the limit set, it looks systematically contaminated in the lower left of the window but the contamination does not extend to the uh, larger k perp modes, which corresponds to longer baselines. And so it doesn't look exactly like the RFI footprint. And what's more is if we coherently average the wall of shame set with the limit set, you can see in the east-west that we, we recover that um, long baseline contamination in the kind of uh, lower right of the window in the east-west dipoles, but not so much in the north-south. So, if this systematic contamination is RFI, it's a different class of RFI that for some reason uh, does not affect the long baselines as much. And that really just depends on the type of scatterer, I think, that is um, putting the RFI in the array. Or it could be an entirely other systematic altogether, right? So for our final limits, uh, we made three of them at three different redshifts. They're all right next to each other. 
left is east-west dipoles, right is north-south dipoles. The blue dashed line is our propagated noise levels, um, and the black solid is the measured power, and the blue solid are the upper limits. And then there's that um, fiducial theory model there again. So uh, if there's a gray shade here, what that means is that the bin was noise limited. Something that's special about this limit um, compared to other limits is that there's a lot of noise limited bins at very high K modes in between the coarse band harmonics. So it's, it's not uncommon to see about half those modes be noise limited and then the others be systematically dominated. In this one, almost all of them are noise limited. And this is something you would expect if you did very exhaustive RFI cutting. So it's, it's possible that that's what is responsible for that. But interestingly, it's not our deepest limit that we've made. Um, the depth of the limit is often driven below the first coarse band harmonic. And um, for some reason, we're systematically limited there at a higher level compared to limits we've made with other data sets. So to conclude, uh, residual RFI exists despite significant improvements in our flagging. We're probably going to have to do better if we uh, want to find the EOR, but uh, it's still very much an open question as to how, how much better we're going to have to do. So um, there are some physical properties that we seem to see about it that seem to suggest that our model of what's going on is correct uh, related to pointing. And um, I think we're really going to have to attack this problem a lot harder uh, just, just to, to really get a handle on it. Because if, if someone claims a detection, we're going to have to know, was it RFI? Was it some other systematic? And I, I think this could pose a serious problem. So thanks. Questions? Oh, I can cast the first stone. Um, just a quick question. What do you think is the apparent flux density of the residual RFI that, that um, we're dealing with here? So I, I only have sort of back of the envelope calculations for this, and I suspect it's in the hundreds of Milijanski, but I can't get more specific than order of magnitude. There. So have you just tried making images? I haven't looked at images of the very deep integrations yet, although we have Helpix cubes laying around. So in principle, we could just look at them. Okay, uh, the question online uh, by Mr. Randian. Yeah. Is it okay? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, in, in terms of uh, why the limit got worse, uh, do you have an idea of how much more rejection happens with this coherent average compared to how many you rejected with uh, the sense, which I believe was incoherent average? So I think it rejects an additional 25% more observations. And the difference between the limits does, is not accounted for by the difference in noise level that you would expect with that much rejection. So there, I think there is some other systematic effect that is worse in the second season of data. That's my guess. Okay, interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Michael. Really interesting talk. Um, so uh, just, I just echo what Randall says about trying to um, isolate these things in in images. Uh, I know Dev has had some really great success with that. Actually, seeing the RFI on the horizon um, and a, a comment on the on the looking west um, obviously RFI is moving is not moving in the same way on the celestial sphere as your as your um, as your sources are if it's actually located on the horizon and I've been discovering in the last week that um, delay delay the, the location of a source on in in uh, on, on the sky in delay delay rate mapping is is um, non trivially related to where you're pointing on the sky so you could make the rfi on the southern horizon go away potentially just by pointing your array west and tracking the sphere as it goes across that's interesting and reminds me of a fringe rate filtering paper that andre offeringa wrote in 2013 i think uh, which i feel like is a similar concept exactly exactly the same yeah absolutely absolutely um, but yeah, um, uh, I, I did have a question, but I think I'll leave it with the comments okay. we can discuss right. later. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's turn to Michael again. 
And our next speaker is Dr. Nico Berry. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I'm Nicole, I'm a Forest Fellow at Curtin University, and I'm going to do a retrospective, but from a perspective of a certain pipeline. So I need to give you a bit of context in terms of the MWA limits or the limits in general so far. Um, you could say the first limit was this proof of concept from an instrument called paper, which no longer exists. It was at uh, 25 million Kelvin squared, uh, which is uh, 25 million millikelvin squared. Um, and given that the signal's at like 10, it was a bit off, but that's okay. It's just a proof of concept. Um, and then the GMRT came through with a limit and then they quickly retracted it. So this might be a very consistent story as we go through. Um, uh, Dylan came through with a 32T limit um, and then came through with an actual full 128T limit. And then the first um, real paper uh, limit came through and it was shockingly low in comparison to the others at 500. And then we have uh, a paper from Adam Beardsley uh, using the MWA and the first low far limit. And then another retraction of the, of, of the paper limit um, and a revision at 40,000 millikelvin squared. And so this just kind of shows you how difficult it is to do this style of, uh, of, of science. Uh, it's really easy to accidentally subtract your signal. Um, and so, uh, the name of the game here is being careful. Uh, a 2019 limit at uh, 4,000 millikelvin squared. And then we start to get into like the heyday of the limits uh, recently. Um, first MWA phase two limit, um, an improvement of the low far limit. Um, CAF came through with the deepest integration thus far. Uh, the first HERA limit. Um, another MWA limit, another MWA limit, um, and then uh, the most recent HERA limit, which is the uh, current best in the field. And then Mike's uh, limit that's going to come through that has a really fantastic story based off of the RFI that you just saw. And so uh, the question is, where do we go from here? Um, LOFAR is coming out with a new limit, and um, the MWA team is certainly not done making their limits. And so what I really want to focus on, dive into, are these specific limits, because these were made using FHD. And this is kind of where I come in. I'm a bit of a representative for this um, on the Australia continent. So what is FHD? It is fast holographic deconvolution, and it is a pipeline. It is a certain way to analyze the data, and it's broken up into some very, um, uh, broad terms, you got some flagging, some calibration, foreground removal, uh, uh, histogramming in Fourier space, and imaging. Uh, this is an oversimplification of what's going on, um, but, but a, a decent representation. And then to actually make power spectral limits, you need epsilon, which Brenna wrote. And if you want more information about the nitty gritty bits, this pipeline, there are two papers on it, the fast holographic paper and um, the FHC epsilon paper as well. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritties because um, it's, it's a lot. In fact, it's, it's this much. So this is all of the git commits on the FHD um, public repo. And it actually, this actually isn't the full representation. I couldn't fit them all. Uh, so this is more accurately <laughs> shows you what FHD is. It's it's a tome. It's uh, um, a series of um, uh, improvements since oh gosh, I think it was twenty thirteen was the first commit. Um, these are the uh, the founding people of FHD: Ian Sullivan, Brenna Hilton, and Miguel Morales. Um, and it spurred uh, the first wave of grad students, of which I came through with. Um, and it's ballooning outward 
um, and to other PhD students who are actively contributing to this type of software. And there's um, about a half dozen more which use this software um, to do their research. And really, I would like to get to a space where these people don't have to contribute anymore and that it's very stable um, and that it can just be used for research. So um, students have to, have to get down into the weeds as much. So again, these are the FHD papers. These are the limits which have used FHD in some uh, way to do their research. Um, and on the left here, I have what I'm going to call a celebration of, of what this limit or what this particular paper saw that um, uh, they improved upon. And on the right, I have a lament because this is an ongoing deal. Um, we keep seeing things that we're very sad about. And so uh, Beardsley et al. 2016 was the very first FHD paper. And I think the, the best part about this paper is the data selection. Um, there are quite a few things that went into this paper. Obviously, I'm, I'm glossing over a bunch, but uh, there was a lot of careful data selection that went into this basically a, a first cut. Um, and this is where we really saw that, in fact, you have to flag over half your data. And this is also a lament, right? So here on this plot, you have four pointings before Zenith all the way up through four pointings after Zenith. And we found that only the very center pointings are good enough for your. Uh, and then we have our 2019 B limit, which focused on a couple of things, I think, in terms of the broader context. One of the things that it did uh, specifically was look at al analysis systematics. So improving the precision and accuracy of our analysis had very significant by eye improvements in our simulations, as you see here. Going from something that's more blue is good. Um, that's also its limit. Uh, we're not done. There's still quite a bit of contamination in the window that's caused from our analysis itself, regardless of the data. And then our first uh, MWA phase two paper um, used redundant configuration style analyses to uh, calibrate. And this was a great proof of concept, and we hope to carry this forward, except I think you might see the pattern here. Um, it's also a lament. Redundant calibration isn't the answer, um, isn't the sole answer. It doesn't quite get to the precision that we need. And then you have a paper from Matt Kolopanis, which looked at delay space. Um, it used some FHD calibrated data um, and found that it can, it can make a really nice limit using a slightly different uh, uh, metric. Okay, you get the point here. Um, there's also uh, some very tricky bad things that come through with delay space. Um, as you can see here with these orange uh, data points, those suffer from some sort of, I don't, I don't wanna call it signal loss, but some sort of weird systematic, which is artificially decreasing your power. And if you account for that, you get these black data points. So uh, that's maybe a bit of a pitfall we need to focus on. And then Mike just showed this lovely limit um, and that faint RFI, uh, we're flagging a bunch of it. Obviously there's still some left over. Um, and uh, that's something that we need to focus on in the future. So where are we going from here? I'll give a little bit of a perspective of what I would like to focus on. In the future. Uh, but I have to show uh, this lovely map from Mike Creel, who is an online uh, um, Mike Creel, sorry. Uh, this is uh, a map of the uh, uh, galactic plane using the engineering development array 2. Um, he made it in spherical harmonics and I put it into point sources because that's just too difficult for me. <laughs> I'm glad he's not online to hear that. Um, uh, and this is what it looks like um, out to this white line, which is about like 15 degrees off of the, uh, uh, the galactic plane. And I've highlighted the galactic center as the blue star there. Um, and it sets over the course of a night of MWA observation of EOR0, which is one of our prime fields. 
and I had to turn it into point sources because of how the beam is acting towards the edge um, there, towards the horizon. It has a very steep gradient, so I can't just take a singular beam value and multiply uh, on top of a spherical harmonic. It's not a good representation. And so in order to use spherical harmonics, we'll have to build a whole new set of infrastructure that I really wasn't prepared to do yet. And so in order to make visibilities from 15 million point sources that I've made um, from this galactic plane, I need a very fast GPU modeler. And that's where Jack Line comes in with, uh, with Woden. And this is what that galactic plane looks like through an interferometer. Um, I have not multiplied by a beam here. This is just full sky. And you can see that it does not look like the galactic plane. It's very ripply. And that's because the galactic plane, as it sets over the horizon, is going over a hard edge. And when you take a Fourier transform over a hard edge, you get ripples. And so this is actually uh, quite nefarious because the galactic plane is so bright. And since you are MWA people, I will show you what that looks like through the MWA beam itself, um, through the two different polarizations, uh, north-south and east-west. And you can see it's worse in the uh, dipoles that are aligned north-south because they are sensitive east-west. Um, this is at the level of about a couple of milijanskis per pixel. Uh, but we're all interested in data here. So this is what uh, removing the galactic plane from, from Mike uh, looks like in data. So this is two minute observation and robust weighting. Um, you can see the galactic plane there towards the, the far left. It's extremely bright, um, which is quite shocking because that's at about 1% beam level. Um, it's at about 100 milijanskis per pixel. Uh, maybe a bit more. As you can see, it's rippling throughout the entirety of the image through the primary beam, which I know is uh, where a lot of people do their science. And uh, if you do some statistics uh, on just the, uh, basically the noise of the leftover image, you can see that if you subtract the galactic plane, you have a much tighter uh, noise Gaussian. Um, and so this, this, Galactic plane essentially raises the noise level for most people's science. And so trying to remove it in a systematic way might be important for other people as well. And so I'm working on a bit of a completeness metric as well as an euro metric um, along these lines. And I don't have a direct number for you here um, because I want to make sure that it's uh, consistent. But it does seem like you detect about twice as many false sources if you don't uh, subtract the galactic plane. So really briefly, I want to find out what this does, the subtraction of the galactic plane does for our MWA limits. So I processed 50 hours of uh, high quality data from 2014. So this is using SINs to pick, pick the very best um, data and, um, and, and other calibration metrics as well. And I want to show this a bit of a diagnostic here. This is delay space. This actually isn't power spectrum space. I'm using delay space um, because I can do it uh, per observation without making an image. Um, and you can see there's stuff that's popping up through here um, that you probably shouldn't be seeing otherwise for clean data. Um, this black line here is showing you where stuff is at the horizon. And as we flip through, you can see that there's bright things popping up on the horizon, even in this very simple metric um, with data that is supposedly clean. So here are those diagnostic images from Dev Null um, using Hyperdrive and Hyperbeam. Um, and uh, we're flipping through a variety of different observations here. You can see Dev also sees the galactic plane on the edge there. Um, but what I really want to show you to zoom in on the southern horizon, you can see there are some nasty things that are going bump in the night towards the south. Um, those are RFI sources. 
and uh, these have passed. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what observations these are, um, but I think they've passed a variety of metrics, uh, which is really concerning. And perhaps what we're seeing in those diagnostic um, delay images. And so, out of these uh, 1,400 high quality uh, data observations, I'm flagging half again, and that um, makes me very sad. Um, and I think it makes Mike sad as well. Um, we've basically uh, uh, come to the same conclusion, um, and this is sad for me because I wanted to see what the contribution of the galactic plane was. I didn't want to see RFI. I think no one does. Um, so this is what um, the new limit would be in comparison to the 2019 limit, um, same redshift band. Uh, it's about uh, twice as high for our most sensitive polarization. If you look at the other polarization, the one that's probably sensitive to the RFI, However, it's three times lower. This gives us a hint that it is this residual RFI, which is the main contaminant for EOR studies. And so I think going forward, we'll have to put more um, efforts towards uh, metrics and RFI flagging, partly because I don't want to be throwing away that much data anyways, and partly because Mike would like to make a nice limit. Some future directions. Uh, for FHD, um, we are uh, partnering with ADEX, uh, spe specifically Joel, who is here today. Hi, Joel. Um, to translate FHD into Python and professionally package it so students can use this um, um, extensive software to do their research. Um, we've thrown about a quarter of a million dollars at it. Um, and. Uh, it's looking great. So, if you are interested in, in using some sort of Python pipeline to analyze your data um, in a spectrally smooth way, um, this might be for you. And really brief, briefly for the black belts in the room, this is a six hour comparison between um, FHD and PyFHD, and it's subtracting better in the wedge. So that's it for me. Just really briefly, the galactic plane aliases, um, even at 1% beam sensitivity. Faint RFI over the horizon seems to be our main contaminant thus far, and we are always making strides towards deeper limits. Thank you. Questions? I guess you guys saw the LOFAR paper describing the uh, the Starlink satellite. Yeah. So we're about to do a follow up paper with data from the EDA2. Yeah. Um, and it's not pretty. Yeah. Uh, we, we're getting great engagement from the SpaceX engineers in that discussion, which is positive, and they're not doing anything wrong. Um, but it is looking uh, quite dire. Um, and it's not just uh, Starlink, it's um, many other of these mega constellations that are going to come along. Um, might be a good idea to get some EOR eyes on this paper, and in particular Mike, actually. It'd be good to talk to you about what we're seeing and um, what the possible mitigations can be. But uh, any ideas you've got? Um, and often I think back sort of... 20 years, maybe longer, and the likes of Frank Briggs and others doing uh, fully coherent, active RFI mitigation at the voltage level, that seems to have completely disappeared off the, off the agenda. And I wonder if we're just going to be forced back to considering mitigations at that level. Be interested in your thoughts, people who care about the one EOR. Yeah. Um... Couple of ideas, uh, not solely my own, um, would be to make limits within TV bands, um, which sounds a bit counterintuitive. So you have to take a certain frequency set to make a limit, right? And the edges of the TV band are the problem because you're FFT being, FFTing over hard edges. If you make a limit solely within the TV band, you kind of get around the whole hard edge thing. 
Um, it's not intuitive. not intuitive and not tested. Um, <laughs> so take it with a grain of salt. Um, another thing potentially would be to have some sort of uh, really fine time resolution deconvolution, um, but that is computationally exhaustive. And I don't know if that's something that we can really uh, uh, focus our resources on. Um, my other suggestion is don't delete our data. We may um, need to rely on this older pre Starlink data. Um, so uh, we need to be very careful going forward in terms of uh, data deletion. Yeah. So sorry, only la one last question, probably Mike, uh, Miguel. So is your guess as to why the 2013 limits are coming in a little better is that the RFI environment you think is better in 2013 than 2014? Yeah, I suspect so. And I, I might not be the, the expert in the room on this, um, but uh, uh, WA is perhaps a bit behind the times. Um, and it took a while for digital TV to become uh, quite popularized in WA. And I think that's what we're seeing. I think I think there was a ramp up. Um, and the amount of, uh, of transmissions, but I could be wrong. Mike, uh, is that right? Or is that wrong? Okay. <laughs> so I have seen sort of strange things, which is. Okay, if you look at analog TV versus digital TV, digital TV has a very flat power spectral density. Analog TV is focused on a couple of carriers. Some of it is the visual carrier, some of it is the audio, and then there's the color. Um, sometimes what I will see is something that is narrow in the TV band, exactly where the audio carrier, sorry, the visual carrier should be. And so I see that in the 2013 data, I saw less of it in the 2014 data. Oh, but this is just two years. Yeah. So, interesting. Okay, so I think we will have a lot of discussions after, um, yeah, after lunch. So let's thank all speaker of the session. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's start the afternoon session. The first session is still on the UR. Uh, the first speaker. That one is uh, Mr. Takumi Ito. So let's welcome. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Takumi from Japan. Today I will talk about uh, foreground removal uh, with the Gaussian process regression. If this one is a foreground, that you anyone please may arise. Okay, from here. Okay, uh, when we observe the EO wall, a 21 centimeter signal at the EO wall, the observed signal is composed of the foreground and 21 centimeter line and noise. And unfortunately, as we know, the foreground is much more brighter than EO wall signal, so avoidance or removal of the foreground is important. But how uh, to remove the foreground? Uh, we can use the difference between the foreground and EOR signal. For example, the, as we said, the emission strength, the foreground is much more brighter than EOR signal. And uh, as shown the uh, bottom figures, the foreground is almost from synchrotron emission. So the spectral of the foreground is very smooth. Okay, and uh, there are various foreground removal techniques like the uh, ZMCA and the fast IC and the PCA and ZPL. And uh, it's reported that uh, ZPL has better performance uh, than fast IC and ZMCA. Okay, here's my research. I apply ZPL method to uh, MWA data, and ZPL uses covariance uh, called kernel to represent data. So the best kernel set may be different for each telescope. So uh, we compare some of the kernel uh, combination by Bayesian evidence. And uh, imaging might be affected foreground removal. So 
This time we uh, do the visibility based foreground removal. Yeah. Okay, from now I will explain what is a Gaussian process regression and how we can remove foreground using Gaussian process regression. Here, uh, as I said, our data consists of the foreground and your signal and noise. And assuming each component to be statistically uncorrelated, uh, we can uh, write the covariance of the data is the covariance of the foreground plus the final sentiment line plus its noise. And uh, now Gaussian process mean uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution. I mean, if we assume random value f follows Gaussian process, we can write f as a Gaussian. And assuming the data is Gaussian distributed, uh, we can model its probability distribution as a Gaussian. And we can uh, write joint probability distribution of the Gaussian process at a series of the diff sorry, as a point in space nu dash as the bottom equation. And for the case of the foreground removal, uh, we want to estimate a foreground model f so uh, we can replace this new uh, d dash to the foreground and rewrite the equation and from the above equation uh, we can calculate the uh, expected value of the foreground right there and to remove foreground uh, we can subtract the expected value of the foreground from the data and get a residual Okay, uh, from now I'll explain what is covariance or called kernel. Okay, uh, Martin kernel is wild, uh, widely used kernel in ZPL. This is the equation of the uh, Martin kernel, and uh, the top uh, figure uh, represents the uh, correlations between different frequencies. And the on the horizontal axis, zero means out correlations, and it's uh, getting distance. The correlation getting low, getting lower. And uh, to explain how the correlation decrease, there are three parameters: its variance and the rank scale and the spectral parameters. Variance means the amplitude of signal, and the rank scale is a typical the scale of the correlation in the data across frequency and the uh, spec A determines a spectral parameter and it, it determines the overall smoothness of the data. Okay, uh, this plot shows a randomly generated data plot with matter and kernel with shown parameters. The top panel is the uh, plot with the eta to infinity and rank scale and variance equal one. And, uh, and bottom panel is also has the same eta equal infinity, but the rank scale and the variance become 100. Uh, compared to those uh, figures, we can see the larger uh, variance means the signal is more stronger, and the larger, uh, larger coherence scale means the signal is more correlated in your frequency. Here, uh, there is also a random generated data plot with uh, matter and kind of shown the parameters and top panel has the eta equal 1 over 2 and the bottom panel has the eta uh, to infinity and as we can see the larger eta means the data is spectrally smoother and we know the foreground is spectrally smoother so we can use this difference to set the kernel and remove foreground Okay, this is the components I use to remove foreground. Uh, I sent the smooth foreground and non-smooth foreground and the additional component and the H1. And it is reported that the covariance of the 21 centimeter line is well approximated by uh, eta equal 1 over 2. But unfortunately, uh, we don't know what are the best foreground kernel for MWA. So, uh, I compare some kernel sets using Bayesian evidence. Okay, here is the uh, applied kernel and its parameter priors. For the smooth foreground, I set eta to infinity and the 
uh, prior of the coherent scales uh, there. And for the not the most foreground, I compare eta equal 5 over 2 or 3 over 2. And the coherent the prior of the coherent scales over there. For the additional component, we also compare the eta equal 5 over 2 or 3 over 2. Then the, uh, the, the prior is there. And for the h1 is there. And finally, I apply ZPL to the data with its kernel set and compare its evidence. Uh, the data is this time the high band observation in 2015 at two hours at UR0. Okay, this is a result uh, one and base kernel for MW. I, as I said, I compare based on evidence of the different kernel sets. The horizontal axis is the K perpendicular. The vertical axis means the delta evidence. This is the uh, difference of the evidence. Uh, higher delta evidence means it's more be uh, more better model. Uh, as we can see, the chosen kernels are depend on the value of the k perpendicular. Okay. From these chosen kernels, I did the foreground removal. This is a 2D power spectrum of the data and residual and residual of the residual noise. The left panel is the 2D power spectrum of the data and the middle one is so its residual. I did the foreground removal as a graded visibility minus foreground model. I got this residual. As we can see, the post band harmonics disappeared after foreground removal. And the right panel shows the ratio of the residual and noise. This noise is estimated from the even odd difference. As we can see, the power of the residual is almost same with uh, estimated noise. Okay, by the way, this time uh, I set the additional component, but additional component has a similar coherent scale to H1 kernel as I shown the top. Additional component has a 0 0.64 to 1.92, but the H1 is also 0 0.1 to 1.2, so it's doubled. So subtracting additional component may cause signal loss. So to check this signal loss, five minutes left. Okay, thank you. I uh, generate multivariate Gaussian distribution uh, with kernel as a signal component and apply ZPL foreground removal method to check signal loss. Here, this is uh, uh, some signal I generate. Uh, for the tumors foreground, uh, I choose eta equal uh, infinity and the rank scale is there and the sigma square is there. For the non tumors foreground, is there and additional component is there and the H1 kernel is you know, for the H1 component is there. And I combine these signals together and make it as a simulated signal and I apply the GPR based foreground removal to this simulated signal and recover the uh, H1 power spectrum. Okay, this is a recovered H1 power spectrum and it's residual power spectrum. Oh, sorry, this is a H1 power spectrum and the residual power spectrum. Blue plot shows the H1 power spectrum and the orange one is the power spectrum of the residual. And if ZPR work well, I mean the ideal parameters are chosen and the the signal are completely represented by kernel, no signal loss even if we subtract the additional component. Okay, and this is a conclusion. Um, let's say we apply uh, ZPR based foreground removal to MWA observational data. And we find a kernel set with additional power kernel has, be has a better Bayesian evidence. So, I mean, it's better to add the uh, additional power kernel, but uh, and after the foreground removal, the residual is smaller than observed data. Uh, if I convert the 2D power spectrum to the 1D power spectrum, 
uh, if we not subtract the additional component, the power getting around 10 order 2 Jansky square. If we subtract the additional component as a foreground, uh, we get the 10 to 3 Jansky square of the foreground removal. And maybe no signal loss uh, even we, if we subtract additional component. Okay, uh, this is my talk. Thank you for listening. Other questions from the. Oh, no, sorry, from the. No, from the lady. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, excellent talk. I really liked your exposition. <clears throat> um, have you managed to break it in the sense that you can create signal loss? And the reason I'm asking is because it is useful to know the edges of where these techniques are applicable and where they might break down. Sorry? Uh, have you managed to produce a scenario where you try and subtract the component and it does cause signal loss? Uh, you mean the... Um, so you're regressing for the foreground component. Yes. And then you subtract this and the goal is to not create signal loss. And you've shown that your method is capable of preventing signal loss. I'm wondering if you've yes. managed to find a situation where it breaks down. I mean, uh, if it, I don't know what you mean. We can talk later. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, can you go back to the slide where you were showing the um, components, the different components you had, and what you've taken? Uh, maybe sorry. Um, the the math where you're showing the the very parameters of your different kernels. Parameters of kernels. There. Maybe. Here? Is this what you actually used? Yeah. So, I'm sorry, not this one. The one where you'd actually tell me what eta and sigma and L are. Uh, from what you fit from the data. I think it's later in the talk. Eta. So, you quote your sigma for the different components the, of the thing you actually removed from the data. Can you, can you go almost to the end of your talk? Sigma is what? Can you go to the end of your talk, almost the end of your talk? Where you show the different parameters of your kernels. Different parameters of the kernels. Beyond here. Not here. Keep going. <laughs> Further. Here. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, it looks to me. So I'm I'm not an expert in GPR. I'm trying to catch up. Um, it looks to me like your sigma squared, which I think is the brightness of your various components. Mm -hmm. Is the highest for your non smooth component of the foreground? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, in this uh, situation, the highest amplitude is a non smooth foreground. Um, but this parameter is from. When I apply these kernels to my data, uh, yep. We get the results of the parameters of the variance of the tumult foreground and non tumult foreground, right? Sure. Yeah. And I use the typical value of the. Uh, I use the typical value uh, decided by data to make the like simulation like data. Okay. So this so, varies from the. So this ref reflects what you were actually fitting with real data. Is that right? Okay, so I absolutely believe that that's what comes out of fitting of the data. The concern I have is that what this is suggesting is that you're, you're, you're dominated by something that is not spectrally smooth. Now, traditionally, when we try to do separation of the EOR from the foregrounds, the, the leverage we're using is that EOR is not spectrally smooth and the foregrounds are spectrally smooth. So I'm surprised that your dominant component, which you're labeling as foregrounds, are not spectrally smooth. I will say that the galactic plane, as it aliases, creates a non-smooth component that looks similar to that. I'm not surprised that you see spectrally not smooth stuff in your foregrounds, I'm sorry. I should have said that more carefully. What I worry about is that 
that is the, the spectral smoothness is the leverage that we have to be sure that we aren't being confused and that we're really not separate, not, not removing cosmological signal. Um, your simulations, I think this maybe goes back to, to Mike's comment, your simulations where you're doing signal loss, um, it'd be really nice to look at some simulations where you are putting in a different signal for the EOR, different expected signal for the EOR than what you're fitting for. And I think there's a paper out of LOFAR, well, there's paper commenting on a LOFAR result and another paper coming out of a LOFAR that looks carefully at this. And they and they see that they can have signal loss. And so it'd be nice to see where, where you, in what situations you get signal loss. Okay, so uh, I have a question. Actually, go to the slides just before the next. Before the, yeah. Or, uh, yeah, this one. So, uh, uh, from previous one. No, another, sorry. Sorry, uh, the, the, you show the power spectrum that you had the wiggles in the small scales. Okay. No, next one. Next one. Or well, probably next. <laughs> sorry, I forgot. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think that, so the wiggle on a large scale, a uh, small scale, does it bother you? The wiggles, the wiggles in the large scale. Yeah. Of the large scale. Is that systematic due to the, the GPR method itself or is uh, kernel things or what? But I'm not sure why it's like fighting. Okay. So we have one minute for last question. Okay, so in that case, let, let's leave the time for the next speaker, and uh, we thanks uh, again. And now our next speaker is um, Dr. Catherine Elder. She's online, so Catherine. Hello. Hi, Catherine, just one moment. Uh, if you could share your slides. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, Catherine. Uh, hi, I'm Catherine. I'm a PhD candidate here at ASU, uh, working with Danny Jacobs. Uh, and I'll be talking about the effect of radiative mutual coupling on beam pattern. So first motivation, very quickly, uh, working in the EOR group means looking for that 21 centimeter global signal. Uh, as it's been discussed with other speakers, um, systematics and foreground leakage are two of the uh, primary obstacles in actually making that 21 centimeter detection. So these are things that uh, are of great concern and need to have a lot of understanding, which means we need to understand the instrument and the beam pattern as well very well. Um, and more than that, um, there is recently the paper by uh, Colopanis 2023 that detected or uh, they noticed common mode uh, effects in the phase two data. So this is an example. Uh, this is an image from the paper where you can see this is a baseline that does not have any common mode systematics. So you have the foregrounds here and uh, on either side it's clear and then a baseline that does have common mode. And so you can see that signal there. Uh, and what this can cause, um, as I uh, was discussed in Morales et al. 2022, this can introduce an overall positive bias when you are then gridding to a UV plane. Uh, and also, interestingly, an overall negative bias if you're using the delay power spectrum like was done in the original paper. Um, but either way, it introduces a bias that is not what we want when we're trying to actually make this uh, detection and, and reducing down the data to be able to uh, get closer to the limits that were discussed earlier. And uh, so this can cause it to appear as a noise limited EOR constraint. And obviously, when we already have so many other constraints, we don't want to be introducing artificial ones as well. So to try and avoid these common mode systematics, 
it, it resulted in about 50% of the data being flagged and 100% of the east-west baselines being used in that data set. So, obviously, that is a large chunk of data that is just getting thrown out, uh, and especially a large chunk of redundant baselines, which are used frequently in EOR analysis. Uh, and so, more information needs to be understood about where this common mode is coming from, what is causing it, and in the discussion of what could possibly be the cause in this case, uh, it was brought up that it could be caused by radiative mutual coupling. So radiative mutual coupling is an effect that has been studied uh, by the HERA collaboration a lot, who I work with a number of them, which is why I'm familiar with it. Um, and it is the effect of when you have astrophysical radiation coming and hitting your array, it can then unfortunately bounce out of one antenna and then be re-radiated into the other antennas. And so you've got not just signal from your sky coming into your antenna, you now also have signal from the surrounding antennas coming in. And that can cause a similar appearance as what was shown on the previous slide with that common mode. Uh, Kern et al. 2020 looked at this effect in HERA data. Uh, one of the differences between what was seen in the HERA data versus the MWA phase two data was that in HERA, it showed this common mode showed a phase rotation versus time. So it evolved with the sky. Uh, whereas that was not evident with the MWA phase two data. So that is a possibly pointing towards this is not the same effect, but there also the HERA data was a lot much larger data set, a lot more time. And so that's another thing is being able to look at more data, longer timelines, being able to, to see how it changes, it could still be an effect. Um, Josiah does that all. 2022 covered a semi-analytical approach to radiative mutual coupling, again, focusing on HERA, but still applicable to the MWA. And they noted that uh, redundant baselines were affected the most by this effect. So again, when we're looking at phase two data and the hexagonal configurations, we're looking at redundant baselines and when those things, when those are baselines specifically are affected, that can cause a problem for our research. So to understand better how specifically radiative mutual coupling could affect the beam pattern uh, for the MWA, I have been going through and working with FICO models of the MWA dipoles and tiles. So the initial model was provided to me by Adrian Studio. Uh, loads and sources, I followed the steps that were outlined in the uh, Sokolowski et al. 2017 paper and following through the process of building up the FEE primary beam model that's uh, currently in use. Uh, and I've been using that paper as a basis to try and make my FICO model as close as possible to the model that was used uh, for the currently in use primary beam model. But one of the big differences between my model and the established FEE beam model is I have a tile of 16 dipoles and I am exciting all 16 of them. So FEE is finite embedded element where only one dipole was stimulated at a time uh, and then everything to combine all of those beams was done outside of FICO, I am stimulating it all in FICO at once to try and specifically see what can happen uh, when you have dipoles acting both as sources and receivers. Um, so radiating and receiving. Um, and also it just saves time when you're still in the proof of concept phase. Um, of going through and exciting all 16 dipole and uh, at the same time. Uh, so this is just the, the layout of the tile. And then this is an example. Um, my talk is going to be filled with a lot of movies and images because most of my work outside of this is looking at power spectra line plots. 
So anything that's colorful and moving is very exciting to me. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of that in my talk, um, but this is an example of what uh, I've been looking at for a big portion of the last several months. Uh, and this is for a single tile, what the beam pattern produced by FICO is when all 16 dipoles are stimulated at the same time. Um, so this is just for single polarization, frequency 80 to 300 megahertz. Uh, and this is the uh, 2D projection of that uh, as we go through frequency. Color bars are not on this plot because Python hates me. Um, but this is in DB, and the uh, after everything has been normalized, the peak is around, uh, I think, negative 20 DB. Um, so this is my single tile FICO model. And uh, for reference, this is the same type of plot, but using uh, the hyper beam to get the FEE model. Um, and again, similar color scale as well. And so seeing similar patterns, similar shape in that. Uh, and then in the comparison, so subtracting, we get this, which the goal would have been to have it be zero. Um, and clearly it is not zero. Uh, again, without color bars, this can be a little bit difficult to understand. I believe the maximum on this is about uh, negative 30 dB, I think is the maximum, but I could be wrong about that. Again, Python hates me and wouldn't let me have color bars. Uh, but just to uh, um, play it again so you can see that strange pattern starting with infinity symbols. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff that still needs to be understood for me of what the differences are between my beam model and what the FEE beam model is saying. Because again, the goal would be for the differences to be zero or close to zero. Um, and then this is uh, just waterfall plots of frequency versus theta for two different phi cuts, phi zero and phi 90, so E plane, H plane. Um, and side by side, you can see they have very similar structure and um, similar color scale as well. Um, and uh, you can see there's a glitch here in FICO that needs to be investigated. And uh, it can it becomes apparent when um, when you take the uh, difference of these two. And again, the goal would be for these to be near zero and they're not. Um, so there's still more work there, but at least getting close to uh, being able to show that my basic single tile FICO model is uh, similar to the current FEE beam model. So moving on then, uh, the uh, paper by Colopanis et al., uh, they looked at three different configurations of three tiles, three baselines uh, in the phase two data. Um, trying to look at, again, those redundant baselines, so short baselines. So we have uh, this, this is where it's going to get confusing because now we've got multiple models floating around. So I'll be referring to them as the shortest baseline, medium or north-south baseline, and longest baseline. And just hang in there with me. We'll get through it and understand. But these are the three types of uh, configurations of three tiles. So now I am going, I am taking three tiles in FICO, stimulating 16 dipoles on one tile, and then going through and looking at what that looks like. So this is the difference. I'm no longer comparing to the FEE beam. I'm just comparing to my uh, one tile difference or uh, one tile beam. And this is the type of uh, beam model difference that I get. And so you can see that for, again, those B cuts, um, most of it is just sort of noise. And then there is a strong structure. This is a completely different scale structure for this in the H plane in the Y polarization. Um, and I suspect that that would be because of the orientation of where the other tiles are. And that would indicate that there is an effect having multiple tiles 
being modeled in FICO is showing that that does have an effect on the beam, that there is a difference between an isolated tile beam and a beam with multiple tiles, um, which was the goal of trying to see how that would have an effect. So did the same thing for the orientation of uh, tiles with longer baselines. Um, and again, get a very similar beam pattern, a uh, difference between the three tiles and the one tile. Uh, and then interestingly, when we look at the difference of, again, this is where it gets confusing, three tiles, one with long baseline, one with short baseline, the pattern is very similar to what was seen in comparison to just a single tile. I would have expected that these two would be more similar because even though they have different baseline lengths, it's a similar uh, structure. Um, but as you can see, they are very similar. Um, and in fact, there seems to be, it's these differences are brighter, meaning they're are more differences between the three, the two different three tile beam models. Again, I did warn you this would be very confusing. Then between three tiles and one tile. Okay, we're nearly there. This is the last orientation, and this is the one that is different in that it has a north south baseline of those tiles. And so when that shows up in uh, these differences, you can see it's a completely different pattern, or at least me, who's been staring at these for a very long time, it's a very different pattern. Um, and so it's, it's very interesting to see that that different orientation, again, does have a very different effect on the beam. And again, you can see when you difference it with the uh, short baseline three tiles, again, there is that different pattern there. Um, and so when we look at the, the difference plots, you start seeing more structure um, in all across both polarizations and both V cuts um, and seeing the difference in uh, comparison with the one tile. Um, again, you can you start seeing more structure and uh, more differences in those beam patterns. Um, so, to wrap up of what continuing work is, um, again, still need to understand better what the differences are between my FICO model and the FEE model of where those things could be coming from. Look into that glitch I noted um, because it uh, only appears in my FICO models and does not appear to have a physical uh, source to it, and so need to understand where that is coming from. Um, stimulating a different tile. So, for instance, I'm stimulating this tile for this orientation, and the next step would be to change which tile is being stimulated um, because that has an effect on the polarization as well. Um, and then eventually the goal is to start looking actually at more of the phase two data than was looked at in the original paper um, to try and understand more of that common mode uh, systematic. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yes. Um, let's go Cass first. Uh, can you hand it to Cass? Uh, hi, Catherine. This is um, Catherine Trott. Thank you for that talk. Um, I have a question that might be difficult for you to answer, but I'd be interested in your comment on it um, based on what, what you've seen. So with the SKA in the core, we have 38 metre stations, each of which has 256 dipoles that are two metres high. Some of those stations will be quite close together, and we're talking a, a handful of metres, not 14. So two questions. Um, can you comment on how you think this effect will come through in SKA data? And secondly, whether FICO would even have the ability to model that when you have so many dipoles? Yeah, um, I mean, from my perspective, uh, even just modeling a single tile, that's 16 dipoles that are only um, a, a little over a meter apart. 
So that's something as well of when trying to understand where those differences between the FICO model and the FEE model come in is I'm even wondering, um, is it possible that FICO is picking up on even mutual coupling coming from just the individual dipoles in a single tile um, that is showing up because all of them are being stimulated at the same time. So I don't know how well, I'm still trying to understand how well FICO is modeling this effect, uh, but it is very possible that it could model uh, this, this type of mutual coupling that happens even within a meter or so instead of um, many meters apart. But I know uh, a lot of the work that's been done with Hera, that's, you know, for spacing of, of 14 meters. So um, I know that that is well established, but I don't know if there's a lot of basis for much shorter um, spacing between elements. Okay, thank you. So, yes, on, on the back. Hi, Catherine, this is um, Chris Jordan speaking. Um, thank you. That was a really excellent and enjoyable talk. Um, I don't actually have a question. I just have a comment. I just wanted to um, point out that uh, if your beam responses are really close to the close to the horizon or straight up, then um, you'll encounter numerical um, problems. So basically, uh, any comparisons you make there might be misleading you. And um, maybe I'm already preaching to the choir, but I just wanted to point that out. Thanks again. Thank you for writing hyperbeam. Uh, no other question, let's thank. Oh, no, Matt, here we go. So, uh, I, I, this is a half form question. Um, in these, did you, because you have the S parameters of the actual feeds themselves ends up going into this. Are those for the MWA mostly real, or there's is there significant, you know, uh, imaginary capacitive or inductive terms in there? And, and do you think that would make a difference uh, in terms of how these interact? Is that a well formed question? You're allowed to say no. I'm, I'm just thinking this out on the fly. Uh, I, I think I understand what you're asking. Um, I will say. Uh, all of the plots that I was showing here, um, all of the data, I was specifically looking at the real data. I do know that, um, especially when it comes to looking at the uh, Jones matrix elements, um, there can be a big difference between real and imaginary. Um, but for getting the uh, voltage gain responses and patterns, uh, I was just focusing on real because a lot of the um, data that I was looking at, especially out of FICO, the way that I was looking at it was telling me that there was nothing in the imaginary component, which was not correct. So I decided that would be a problem for future Catherine. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks to all the speakers in the UR science. Uh, so I'm, uh, by the way, my name's Imao, I'm done my job. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the chair of the next session is uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Wilanski. So, okay, thanks for the advice. Uh, right, so um, I'll stand. This is the uh, SHI session that stands for Solar Heliosphere and Ionosphere session. I don't know anything about SHI, but I think we have some interesting talks lined up. Um, so, uh, first speaker will be Divya, and he's going to talk about the tenure. Past 10 years at the MWA doing SHI. Okay, 40 minutes. He does. Okay. Okay, so, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Yogaroy. Uh, I was thinking about this talk, preparing for it. I realized that I am among the people who have been associated with this project for the longest. Uh, I was there, I mean, I was not there, but I was a part of the project in 2004 when the planning began for 
what eventually became MWA. I've also not been attending uh, the past few MWA project meetings, so I'm really happy to be here and uh, happy to have this opportunity to sort of share this journey with you all. I've also taken the liberty to reduce the scope of my talk. Uh, John Morgan here will be telling you about the heliospheric stuff, and uh, I have not actually talked done much of the ionospheric work myself. I know that there's this really beautiful paper talking about, you know, uh, real-time streaming of plasma, which you could see from the ionosphere to the magnetosphere, but I'm not uh, talking about that here. Some other people who've been uh, really a part of this work uh, for many years, Colin, Ever, and John, I'd like to acknowledge them, and the students, of course, and hear more about it as we go. Okay. So this was uh, actually the title page of a slide which I presented in 2007, uh, a meeting in Hawaii, where there's a young one of the vegetarian legal up there. Many of you have probably seen the tree where the nest is, yep. And this is the team which is being referred to uh, in this slide, uh, which, and this expedition was there to essentially do the survey for the 32 tile uh, system. And uh, Ramesh was yesterday showing some, the first results from the three tile system. This is the first results from the 32 tile system, yep. uh, which was really the first spectroscopic imaging observations of the sun at these frequencies. These data came from something which was called the X13. Uh, Dave Emrick, who's I think online and not in the room, was leading that expedition apart from Chris Williams, who was a grad student at MIT, and Prabhu and Harish from RRI at that time. And what these data already showed us that, uh, so uh, the plot which you have there, it, the colors of the rainbow are different slices in time. They are ordered in the sequence of the rainbow. They're just one second apart. And this was a time when nothing was supposed to be happening on the sun. It was a fairly quiet time. And we found that even at that time, if you were to just look at, you know, different pieces of the data which we had, you found an enormous amount of variability which was there. And if you sort of made an image and put it where that uh, variability is coming from, I really like the format which we could do back then because our resolution was coarse enough, right? So. <laughs> Each of those boxes shows you the spectra for a pixel at the center of that box. So, and, uh, so you can see there's so much spectral structure there, different kinds of variations which are taking place uh, during a quiet time. Right. And we already knew that you know, the sun, the various emission mechanisms which take place on the sun, they span a very large range of brightness temperatures, all the way from about 10 to the power 13 to of something like 10 to the power 4 or so for the gyro synchrotron emission from the CMEs, which is what is shown by these red boxes roughly in the order of the brightness temperatures. The blue boxes show you the circular polarization fraction, which you expect from different mechanisms, and it goes all the way from a fraction of a percent to almost 100%. So we knew essentially that if you really want to do a good job of studying the sun, you need really high quality uh, spectroscopic snapshot imaging, right? You must gather your data quickly. You must gather it over a very short uh, wavelength span. And the range of things you want to study will be varying in, enormously in brightness temperature, so you need high dynamic range imaging. Right? And these sort of the collage at the bottom shows you various aspects of these things. What do they look like in the frequency time plane or perhaps in the images? So this was a key requirement if you wanted to do a good job of solar uh, radio imaging, and fortunately for us, this was a telescope which was being designed, right, because it was uh, being geared towards very sensitive science. You really wanted to do a good job of calibrating the ionosphere, which varies very dramatically over short time scales. So it was being designed to capture good imaging uh, quality data over short temporal and spectral spans, and that is really what made it, uh, that is the key sort of secret MWA source which makes uh, all of our science come alive. So uh, this is familiar to you all, the UV coverages and the uh, zoom in, and that red circle there shows you the sort of UV grid if you were to map or a Nyquist sampling size on the UV plane. 
for a source which is about one degree in size, which is what uh, our sun is roughly. And the beautiful point spread functions from the MWA phase one and the phase two extended configuration is what you have on the right. So, uh, so even though uh, we had an early start uh, in terms of publishing, we had uh, a somewhat of a wait before it picked up, but here are the people who were the driving force for the science which we did, right? So, uh, all the people who have done their PhDs with the uh, MWA data, some of them, the last two are, uh, uh, they are yet to work, I mean, yet to submit their thesis, they are working on their thesis now. In addition, we have also had a few MS students who have contributed in uh, wonderful ways. In terms of our publication record, this is what it looks like now. So this is sort of cumulative number of papers across these years. So we started from one in 2011 and stayed at one till 2016 till Rohit who's sitting back there was beginning to submit his papers. And then since then we've been ramping up and it's not too far from a reasonable straight line. It's about 4.6 papers a year. Uh, across these many years here. So uh, the solar use case is quite different from most of the use cases. So we needed to really develop a bit of uh, our own tools and techniques. Uh, so let me first give you a brief uh, sort of overview of those. So one of the things we really wanted to do, which is a bit unlike what many other solar telescopes want to do, is we wanted to have good absolute flux density calibration. So one of the the first ideas we tried out was sort of uh, a cute one. We said, well, we know the MWA beams, uh, the low radio frequency sky is fairly well known. The MWA receiver is fairly well characterized. The only unknown is the sun. So if we try to solve that equation with only one unknown parameter using you know, the MWA beams on the far uh, right there, the sky in the middle, and what a single baseline, which is small enough to not resolve out the sun, is going to see the uh, the sky like, let's try to model this and uh, get the solar flux density. Fairly successful, I would say, but it really relied on the availability of baselines, which are small enough to not resolve the sun. That was no longer available when the phase one, phase two extended configuration came online. So we needed to look for other ways for doing this uh, calibration. Uh, and then these were the sorts of things we tried. We sort of tried a multi-pronged approach. Uh, there is the serendipitous presence of a few bright sources, especially given the very wide field of view of uh, the MWA, CRAB, and Virgo A, whose flux densities are well known. By now, we also had good enough imaging that we could actually, if we put our minds to it, see background sources even in the presence of the sun, and Gleam has already given us catalog fluxes for those. And we could also use some of the calibrators which are strong enough to both with and without the attenuation which we typically use for solar observing. Using all of that and the database which uh, Marcin had put together, we sort of built uh, a calibration system. Here is an example image where the red circle shows the sun. This is 10 seconds and average over two course channels. And you can see about 80 sources in the background, the weakest of which is about four uh, Jansky. The uncertainty in our flux densities is largely comes from the uncertainty in the gleam fluxes. It's about 10%. And on the right, that panel shows you consistency between two of the three approaches I talked about in uh, estimating the flux. This is really the correction factor. This is, uh, if you were to use this attenuation, this is what you multiply your observed fluxes by to get to the flux in Jansky. Uh, I said we want to do sort of spectroscopic snapshot imaging. And if you want to do with an instrument which gives you half a second time resolution and 768 spectral channels, you end up with about half a million images every five minutes. Fortunately, you don't need to make that because not every spectral channel is giving you independent information. But you still need to make tens or even hundreds of thousands of images, which necessarily require the pretty robust imaging pipeline. This was our first attempt, sort of creatively called air cars. Uh, on the left is an image when a, when a very strong burst at something called a type 2 radio burst was in progress. The peak there is about 10 to the power 9 uh, Kelvin. And you can still see the background sun, which is sitting at about 10 to the, many times 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 6 Kelvin. The dynamic range of this image is greater than 10 to the power 5. This, I believe, is just about the highest dynamic range which anybody has ever achieved for, for the sun at these frequencies. The other image shows you a quiet, sort of compatibly featureless sun. And that's a harder imaging problem, but we still manage to get a, a dynamic range of about 1,000 if we really push the pipelines to get there. 
This is uh, our latest, latest incarnation of that pipeline. The previous one was only Stokes I. This one now does polarimetry. And what these two panels show you are the, the contours show you the Stokes I, and the color shows you the fractional circular polarization. And this is just to show you that in the standard, uh, you know, various fairly well known bursts where you do expect circular polarization, we are actually detecting that quite comfortably. And where we stand right now is that we can make these uh, images with dynamic ranges roughly between 300 and 10 to the power 5. Flux densities, like I said, have an uncertainty of about 10%. Our polarization calibration is uh, quite comparable to the high quality astronomical observations. Our residual leakage from I to Q is order 1%, and that from I to U and V is about a tenth of that. Yeah. The robustness is still work in progress, but it is fully automated, and we are, of course, trying to make it user friendly. Yeah. So, where do we stand in comparison to other instruments which have been out uh, doing solar imaging? So, uh, you know, the lighter blue bars are. Uh, an estimate at the dynamic range using an RMS far away from the sun. And the darker blue estimates are if you look at your deepest negative artifact and use that to compute your dynamic range. Typically, that's a more conservative estimate. And wherever we could find the data, we, we've uh, compared that. So we are comfortably about two orders of magnitude above. I mean, the best we have done is about two orders of magnitude above the best, which anybody else has done is where we stand, I would say. Yeah. On here are LOFAR graph, that's an instrument in India, NAMSE radio heliograph in France, the GMRT combined data from both GMRT and NAMSE, and the VLAC and D configurations. Right. Okay, so a bit about the science. So we sort of chose our science targets to match the strengths of our uh, instrument and our ability, and also what uh, what are intrinsically interesting problems in this field to work on. So I'll give you a glimpse of some of those. So studies of weak or progressively weaker non-thermal emissions, uh, the gyro synchrotron emission from coronal mass ejections, some studies of very well-known uh, solar bursts. Uh, I should have been doing this. So uh, a CME for perhaps the few in the audience who might not already know are large scale ejections of uh, magnetic Magnetized plasma from the sun. This was supposed to be a movie, but this is a PDF, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah. And these solar type 1, 2, 3, etc., these were bursts which were originally classified just based on their appearance in the dynamic spectra. So uh, don't worry too much about the classification just now. These are just comparatively bright emissions from the sun which have very specific shapes in the time frequency domain. And let's go. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these weak non-thermal emissions, right? So the, on the x-axis here is time, and on the y-axis is what was at that time the weakest uh, published non-thermal emission. So, so the first one I picked is from 1997. That's from a telescope in France, Nancy Radio Heliograph. They were sitting at about 10 SFU. One SFU or solar flux unit is 10,000 Jansky. So it's not a weak source we are talking about. Uh, <laughs> Uh, sometime in 2013, the group in Gauribidnur, uh, India, they published a study of type 1 radio sources where they got down to about 1 SFU. And in the first study which we undertook, we this was before we were doing imaging uh, very seriously. So this is a non-imaging wavelet-based detection of all these islands of emission in the dynamic spectra. Each of these green dots is something uh, which this wavelet uh, algorithm has picked up as a strand of emission there. And we were able to match whatever was the current best at that time. And as a part of Rohit's thesis work, uh, we decided to go a step further where you tried to break down the information which was there in your dynamic spectra into a Gaussian mixture model. And that allowed us to get down to uh, almost an order of magnitude be, uh, deeper, about 0.2 SFU or so. And once we started to do imaging, we could get, you know, down to a couple of millijansky, a couple of milli SFUs, sorry, yeah. It's a factor of four orders of magnitude between them. <laughs> so, so these are really the, the weakest non-thermal emissions which have been reported yet. And these got us really excited because, you know, these uh, 
okay you'll hear about it in the in a talk from rohit who will give you a lot more context but there is this so called coronal heating problem right corona is at a million kelvin and we know that the energy must come from the magnetic field but we don't really know the exact processes which are depositing that energy there one of these hypotheses is uh, for explaining coronal heating is what is referred to as nano flares and what we are really excited about is that we think that these really tiny radio flashes which we are seeing could be the radio counterparts of nano flares right we have subjected them to various tests so far they meet all of our expectations and the nice thing about doing this in the radio is that this emission comes from a coherent emission mechanism which therefore allows you to probe much deep much weaker energies than what is possible in x rays and euv so there people managed to go down to something like 10 to the power 24 ergs which is referred to as the nano flare energy regime we are comfortably about 4 to 5 orders magnitude deeper than that and the deepest studies at x rays and euv have not yet sorted out the coronal heating problem so this green blob here is supposed to show the distribution of the occurrences of these winks as we like to call them all over the quiet sun and the next plot is is uh, shows their sort of uh, distribution function uh, as a function of their strength okay we have been pursuing these in many independent investigations we have verified in multiple different data sets that they are real they are present on the sun all the time when the sun is as quiet as uh, we have managed to capture in our data individually they are too weak for us to look for their counterparts at any other wavelength but we found a instance where there was a group of these uh, winks which were happening close to each other in both space and time and for those data we have managed to find an counterpart in euv uh, data and the energy deposited is just about an order of magnitude larger than what you expect for an individual nano flare unit so these are sort of in the right ballpark we try to look for their spectral characteristics bandwidths or spectral shapes so we think the bandwidths we estimate them to be of order 100 kilohertz or so we've looked at what they look like in the image plane their morphology uh they're usually compact we were trying to see if we can use them to study scatter broadening but we are not quite there yet uh whenever you are operating sort of close to the edge of any system it is always better to do the same thing in multiple different ways to verify the reality of that and one of the things which rohit will talk about is detection of these winks using an independent technique so this is something which is i mean and there's a project which we are still hoping to do with ramesh to look at these winks at higher time resolution we have a little bit of vcs data but not managed to get around to analyzing that but hopefully in not too distant future okay a different strand of uh, the science which we have been pursuing uh cmes i just talked about what they are they are really big explosions they have energetic particles they have magnetic fields so it's only to be expected that some gyrosynchrotron radiation should be coming out from them the only problem was that it was very hard to see because the brightness temperature associated with them was much lower than that of the sun and many other active emissions which tend to be going on when something like a cme is launched So the first detection came from uh, Tim Bastian from using the NANSA radio heliograph only in 2001. That's the red uh, dots, red points on there. This this graph, by the way, shows the entirety of published uh, literature about the CME gyrosynchrotron emissions. The ones on top, above about uh, one SFU or so, they are all non-imaging. The imaging ones are at the bottom, and you'll notice that most of them now come from our work. and in fact what we have uh, managed to show is that with the with the imaging uh, pipelines which we have we are now able to routinely detect these gyrosynchrotron emissions of which there were only two specific examples in imaging since 2001 so in four out of four cases where we have tried to do it we managed to see it and we managed to see it for you know these comparatively slow cmes sort of unremarkable cmes as opposed to the others which were all very fast cmes now i also said that we are now able to do polarimetry and that is something which one can put to very good use here because when you are trying to make this model you have 10 free parameters in the model that's the data which you have to constrain them right so naturally you are going to need a lot of independent information and there are also some uh, uh i'm blanking out on the word there are some degeneracies in the model where for example the magnetic field 
strength and the magnetic field line of the direction the magnetic field is making with your line of sight can be degenerate. So here is an example of a model which you could come up with if you were to use only Stokes I information. In these, for this particular uh, data set, we had Stokes V observations, but not detection. So all those blue points are upper limits. And you see that the model which this uh, framework has yielded is actually not consistent with the upper limits which we have on the Stokes V. If you were to use the information from both Stokes I and Stokes V, you find that you are now pushed to a different part of the phase space where you can find a model. And in oops, let me go back. So here is uh, the corner plot which shows essentially the parameter space which we, you were being led to earlier when you were looking only at Stokes I and how that parameter space has shrunk and how some of the degeneracies Okay, which are here, which is, for example, the magnetic field and the direction uh, of the magnet between the magnetic field and the line of sight, how they have shrunk as you put both of these together. And in fact, for exactly one region in the CME, we have one detection of Stokes V, that's the lowest frequency point there. And in fact, what we find is that in this MCMC framework, which spans, you know, what we think is the entire reasonable set of parameter space for these parameters, we cannot find a single model which is simultaneously able to fit the Stokes I and the lone Stokes V detection which we have. And what this is really forcing us to do is to question the assumptions which this model is making. It is a simplistic model, right? It's assuming a homogeneous distribution along a line of sight, and homogeneous isotropic distribution of the pitch angles, we know that CMEs are not homogeneous isotropic models, but we already have, you know, far too many free parameters to contend with. So people have been trying to, to use as simple models as they possibly can. But this is where we have reached with this. So, okay, changing tracks once again. So this slide actually summarizes, this is a one minute poster which I gave at a conference a few years ago. This really summarizes some of the work which we had been trying to do where the key idea was that in a large fraction of the active emissions which we were looking at, we were finding these quasi-periodic pulsations. On the x-axis, there is the time we found a bunch which were between two and four seconds and another bunch which were sitting at 30 seconds. And across some four orders of magnitude and intensity, they always seem to be there. And the way we are interpreting them now is that it's, you know, imagine a little bit like I have an optical fiber and then there is a sort of a bundle of light which is shooting across it. When that bundle of light is not there, I don't really know anything about the optical fiber. It is that beam of electrons in my case now shooting up across this magnetic field, which is lighting up these magnetic fields. And it is allowing us to see these pulsations which exist all the time, but we become aware of them only when they are being lit up by these uh, uh, coherent emissions which are coming from these uh, places as this electron beam is traversing these magnetic fields. So that's really exciting. So I think of these sort of as test particles which are probing the system. It's really great to see that they are ubiquitous. Okay, the, so, so of course we've been looking at, uh, how much time do I have? I have like 11 minutes. Okay. So we've also been looking at some of the very well-known standard bursts and finding some intriguing features there. So this plot on the left it shows uh, a type three burst. It started out as a single blob of emission, but as it rose, it split into two blobs. So higher frequencies refer to uh, lower coronal heights and lower frequencies refer to higher coronal heights. So you see that the, at the blue, which is the 240, it's sort of a single blob. And as it rises, it has split off into uh, two different uh, regions. So this is sort of interpreted as, you know, a large gradient in the magnetic field, which is splitting into two uh, bundles as it is rising up. The set of plots on the right, uh, they are again a different study of type 3 radio bursts. So again, the, the colors are in the order of the rainbow and they go from higher frequencies to lower or from lower coronal heights to higher. You notice that they sit neatly between the region which is probed at the EUV wavelengths and at the optical, right? There is no, <laughs> there's no probe which is giving you information in that region which is uh, sitting there. And as it happens, uh, all the events which were chosen for this study, they were aligned with the presence of some streamer or the other. And the idea here was to come up with a model for the velocity, for the 
density of these streamers as a function of uh, coronal height. And we found that uh, the densities they came up with is a factor of few beyond the currently accepted models for uh, streamers. Another uh, object of study has been coronal holes. Coronal holes are simply regions of low density. These are regions of open magnetic field lines, so they are not able to confine the plasma, and therefore they are regions of uh, low density in the in the solar corona. And therefore, you typically expect them to be also showing up as darker regions, right? And at the radio, what we do find is, uh, if you look at the set of images on the left, frequencies increasing from top to bottom and from left to right. You do start out with something which is a darker, but by, by the time you're hitting, say, about 145, 130 megahertz, the region which was dark at higher frequencies is now turning out to be brighter at lower frequencies. The same thing is shown in the, the figure below, which shows the cut at that particular uh, line across the solar disk. So this was part of thesis work by Munzibur Rahman, who worked with Igor. And this was explained in terms of refraction of radio waves from neighboring regions, which is sort of, on the one hand, up making the neighboring regions appear a little darker, and on the other, are adding more emission to the region into which this light is being refracted. Now, the first detailed or rather extensive polarimetric study of solar data actually came well before we developed our polarimetric imaging pipeline. That was from Patrick McCauley. And he looked at some hundred different uh, uh, observing spans in the data, all from 2014 and 2015, which was close to the solar maximum, but he carefully chose data during which no solar activity was taking place. And he found in these sort of 400 minutes of data some 700 instances of compact emissions where there was significant Stokes V brightening, which you could see. And the polarization fraction varied from all the way from close to zero to essentially 100%. Also, uh, some of these uh, features which we which he found were broadband in frequency, and it seemed that it didn't really matter if you averaged across the entire bandwidth of the event. The polarization fraction didn't really change very much. That is what is being shown in the histogram on the middle panel. And on the far side, uh, we found a very peculiar structure for some of the coronal holes, especially the ones which happen to be at the center of the disk. There is a very sort of unusual bullseye pattern in the Stokes eye. So there is, you have a central polarization, and around that you have a ring of the opposite sense in the polarization. And in fact, they also find that the, if you build an expectation from the open magnetic field, which is sitting in that co in the center of that coronal hole, that sign does not match the sign of the Stokes V, which you are seeing there. So that's still a little bit of a mystery. We are, in fact, uh, running a project right now to, to try to understand this better. So uh, the same sort of strand was picked up and continued by Mozibur uh, as a part of his thesis. They did a really detailed study. I was struggling to summarize this paper just because there's so much which they did in that. They looked at polarization function as a, a fraction, as a function of the position of the burst, whether you are, you know, at the center of the sun or close to the limb and so on. And, is there a correlation between if the source is moving and the degree of polarization you see and so on and so forth. So really detailed piece of work which we had there. And from the recent uh, polarization pipeline which we have, we have some exciting results as well. One is that we know that our corona is a birefringent medium. So even though the thermal emission which is born there is born unpolarized, as it may, makes its way across this uh, corona, it picks up a weak circular polarization that's predicted to be less than about a percent. That's been known for a while, but for the first time, we think we have detected that. And we, uh, our average detection is a Stokes V of about 0.5%. The residual leakage, we estimate, to be almost an order of magnitude less. And this we can now use to get a handle on the ambient average magnetic field in the corona. It's quite exciting. And that we can estimate uh, using a comparatively simple-minded model right now to about 100 milligauss, which is in the right ballpark. And on the right side, we have actually a very robust imaging detection of linearly polarized emission from the sun. Now, linearly polarized emission from active solar emissions was reported in 60s, but it was sort of scoffed upon and people had to uh, not really withdraw that, but there was a lot of skepticism about it being real. 
bit here. Uh, I think in the work which we have tried to do, we have tried to sort of look at it carefully. We are quite convinced that this detection is, is real. In fact, there are images where you see two linearly polarized sources in the same image, and they uh, show different characteristics. Their linearly polarized fractions are changing differently and so on. So clearly no you know, instrumental or analysis artifact could be giving rise to that. Okay, uh, so where do we stand right now? So to our credit, we have, I think, the best imaging dynamic ranges, the highest polarimetric purities, perhaps the best flux density calibration as well. We're quite excited about these winks which we have discovered, which are the weakest uh, non-thermal emissions which have been discovered yet. Uh, we can now routinely detect the gyrosynchrotron emission from CMEs. We've found them at the largest heliospheric heights. We can even detect the Stokes V from them. Uh, like I was just saying, Stokes V from the quiet sun and linearly polarized emission. So I think all of these are sort of uh, things which are highlighting the ability the imaging prowess and the ability of the MWA to get us to these uh, new results here. Uh, so in terms of future plans, I did not want to get into the specifics of what we are planning for each of the projects. So this is really very broad brush, but I do want to highlight that we have sort of imaged only about 1% of the data so far. So we are big fans of keeping the archival data. <laughs> uh, we do believe we are in a position now to take on larger fractions of the data, having built these pipelines and having understood uh, how to make the data pass through them. So at this point, there are uh, many irons in the fire which are trying to get us access to larger fractions of uh, computing resources. And if, if they work out, we are expecting in the next two to three years to be able to analyze something like to push maybe somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of carefully selected fraction of these data through these pipelines. And that selection of the data is what is currently in progress. We're trying to figure out which are the most interesting pieces of data which we want to uh, attack first here. Solar radio imaging is actually uh, is a very tiny community. Globally, it's a very tiny community. Uh, and it's a, it was a bit of a surprise to me that despite the fact that there is such excellent data which is available in public domain, it, it has not picked up. And I think the way, the only way to make it happen is to not just give people the data, it give people also the means to do something with the data. And that is what we are trying to do by making our pipelines public. I think they are not quite there uh, right now, but I think we are working on them to sort out the remaining kinks so that uh, uh, it is easy for somebody to use them if it comes to them. And I think the other piece which we need to do perhaps is going to come uh, by analyzing more of the data. Right now we are, we have analyzed, a, we have a lot to show, but the fraction of data which has been analyzed is very little, right? If we have something where uh, it makes it more real for people that, yes, if I wanted, I could do it by showing them a larger fraction of the data which has been analyzed and pushed through these. I think that's going to make a difference as well. So that is a desire which we have. That's a direction in which we would like to shoot. Right now, we have two theses in progress and a smaller term project, which is actually about the coronal holes, which I was talking about. One of the uh, long term objectives we have is about space weather, right? What, so. It's the same image which I showed you earlier. Now that blue line is supposed to be the front of a CME and there's supposed to be a lot of this magnetized CME plasma behind that. So the idea essentially is to be able to look at the Faraday rotation of the linearly polarized emission, which is coming from all these background sources, perhaps compact sources, perhaps also the diffuse galactic emission, and then try to be able to, re to invert that data to get a three-dimensional model for the magnetic field in the CME, among other things. And that magnetic field is the holy grail of what makes a CME geo-effective. Right? So that's something which we are shooting for. So plenty of good stuff, I would say, to look forward to both in the near term and the far term. I could not stop myself from showing this slide. We have just made our first uh, Meerkat solar images. This was with the sun in the second and the third side low. And uh, so, uh, Okay, never mind. So 
I was surprised actually at the fraction of flux which we were missing with Meerkat. It's above a gigahertz, it can be as high as 50%, but at lower frequencies, it's, it's quite a bit less. And finally, what I would like to end up with is sort of a word of thanks. We are a small team with rather unusual <laughs> needs and requests for which, uh, with, with which we have approached the management and ops teams many times. So I'd like to express our gratitude to these teams for uh, helping out in the best ways they can. It's also true that most of us are sort of not quite situated uh, uh, in physical proximity. So that means basically that we are not always as well plugged into whatever is happening in the MWA world. So there is a somewhat larger barrier to be overcome. So I would just like to give my big thanks to all the people who have contributed to make this enterprise a success. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Thanks, Devia, for that really awesome talk. Um, are there any questions from early career researchers? Any online folks? Okay, questions from anybody? Yeah, thanks to your talk about the solar activities as well as the observation from low frequency that seems really new to me uh, you said that it's a your small team with quite unusual needs and requests but i believe that it's uh, such kind of research is quite important for space weather okay. right so uh, is there any kind of application for urinal space and the space weather scenes sure so uh what I was talking about here is exactly about space weather. So this is uh, this is something which we are not quite there at. But what you will hear from John Morgan next is application of space weather, which we can already do. That is using interplanetary scintillations. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Right. The same. Thanks for that, Divya. That was awesome. The uh, question is just, uh, even though I'm not really part of the VCS team anymore, well, what was the hold up in the end? Is it just a matter of finding people to have time to process it? That was exactly it. So the student who was going to work on it, he found a different attractive project and latched on to that for his thesis. And that was the only hold up here. Yeah. Ramesh. Thanks, Divya. I have probably asked this question before. You may have answered it. I have forgotten the answer. Um, as you know that uh, for solar wind um, uh, probing, you know, the pulsar timing, you know, often picks up the excess uh, DM. And um, that's mostly just the standard solar wind. But uh, when it comes to CMEs, one thing that is not really quite clear to me is what sort of uh, magnetic field or Faraday rotation do you expect? And uh, is that at a level that, uh, you know, some low frequency measurements can at least uh, in a position to um, put some constraints or, uh, or actually even measure it? Yeah, I think we are, or let's say the the dm measurements have now come to a level where it is it should be possible for uh, pulsar observations to actually catch the excess dm coming because of because of cmes they are at a level of about 10 to the power minus 4 in the dm units so it's quite doable i think and uh, that's one of the things i would like to talk to you about yeah any quick ones Okay, how about another round of applause for Divya? Our next speaker is John Morgan. He's gonna talk about using scintillation to do stuff. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so, as uh, Divya said, I'm going to be um, focusing on the IPS. Um, uh, so, it's very complementary to the work that Divya has been doing on actually um, imaging the sun 
Um, for IPS, we're in common with, with most of you in the room and trying to make sure that the sun doesn't affect our um, observations directly. Um, I didn't want to make this, uh, uh, I, I didn't want to make this sort of, uh, you know, sort of completely war stories about things that happened 10 years ago, but um, I'm going to try and give a little bit of an overview of not just talking, trying, trying to give a summary of everything that, that, that I've done with the MWA over the past 10 years, but um, give, give a basic overview of, of the IPS work um, and some of the um, sort of general things that that uncovered uh, about the instruments and, and, and low frequency radio astronomy um, in general that, that maybe hasn't made it into the, 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 the uh, publications that, that, we've, that we've put out there. Um, I also don't want to give, make it a big uh, thank you for, for, for everything, but I'm really delighted to have um, Ronika and Elaine Sadler in the room um, because they've both been really huge supporters of this work and I'm not sure that we'd have um, got to this stage uh, without them and also, of course, without JP in the early stages. Um, and we still really miss him in this project. So, um, what is IPS um, and what does it measure? Well, IPS is the twinkling of radio sources. It's um, exactly the same physics as the twinkling of the, of the stars that you see with your eyes. Um, but the medium and the distances involved are, are very different. Um, so in the case of IPS, the variability is um, due to the solar wind turbulence, um, and that's at approximately an AU away versus when you see twinkling with your eye or it's um, turbulence on the scale of a couple of centimetres, maybe a few hundred metres to a kilometre away. So conventional imaging with um, an interferometer such as the MWA, um, you measure the coherence um, have a laser pointer here. Um, no. So you measure the coherence of a series of uh, baselines up to a few kilometers in the case of the MWA, um, and with a little sprinkling of um, interferometry magic, that tells you about the, the, the structure of the source that you're looking at. And if you want to, you can even do some, some mathematics and turn that into um, an image. Um, IPS is even more magical it's still measuring that coherence function that visibility um, but you're using um, multi multi path um, uh, propagation through the um, heliosphere um, with lateral separations of a few hundred kilometers so whereas the spatial scales probed baseline lengths and actual resolution in arc seconds given along the top here is for the MWA itself, given by the orange line, and it works out um, similar in terms of resolution to the human eyeball. What the um, IPS is probing is the coherence on the spatial scales given by the blue line here. So when we look at the um, amount of scintillation relative to the mean brightness of the source as measured by the orange line, what we're really measuring is the visibility um, weighted by the blue line versus the visibility weighted by the orange line. And you can see that it gives you an or two orders of magnitude or more increase in resolution without building these expensive long baselines or doing all this complicated VLBI um, and all that kind of thing. So that's what um, IPS is. You can use it for astrophysics um, and you can use it for um, understanding the heliosphere itself. Um, so, how did we get started with IPS with the MWA? Well, that goes back long before I started, but my MWA start, um, story starts about 10 years ago. I joined the project um, soon after, well, while commissioning was taking place, I wasn't formally part of the commissioning team, but I was sort of helping out, particularly with Natasha on the MWA commissioning survey. Um, in the years after that, I continued to work on GEG science, um, a little bit of SHI as well, and was always sort of casting around for a project that I could call my own. And in about early 2015, it was actually Eva who suggested that I um, lead the IPS side of things, which had always been planned for the MWA. Um, Divya and others have been working on it for many years previous to that. 
it was kind of always assumed that you'd want high time resolution and that you would use a beam forming approach. So no one really thought about it until the VCS came online. Um, so eventually, once it was possible to schedule VCS observations, we, we did it. And almost just on a, on a whim, really, I thought, well, maybe we should take some normal observations as well either side just to see if they're usable. And while we were waiting for the VCS data to be processed, I had a look and I saw all of this variability. This isn't actually from um, that very first data set. Um, this is from some data pro processed by Rajan a year or two later. But what I saw immediately was the variability of the sources on time scales of about a second or so. And what's really valuable about taking the imaging process is you get all of the pixels all the time. So you get on source IPS pixels, you get um, pixels that are on sources that aren't IPS sources, you get pixels that don't correspond to a bright source. You've got the whole lot. You can figure out all of the statistics very, very clearly. So we started. Um, you know, sort of uh, um, talking to IPS people and um, bringing it up at conferences and so on. Um, there is an IPS community. It's quite small. They're very focused on space weather, and they hadn't really seen this kind of data at all before. There was a lot of um, skepticism. Even luminaries such as Bill Cole said, oh, yeah, that's not IPS. That's probably the ionosphere or something. Um, and eventually, once we actually started um, uh, presenting the images themselves, that's when people suddenly woke up and realized that this was something quite different from existing IPS beamforming experiments. And actually, there was a huge amount of um, potential um, in it. Um, so uh, Randall, um, when he just became director, um, encouraged me to start scheduling a few more observations um, through director's time, which we did starting in 2016. Um, and about the same time, um, I switched over from looking at these little plots of individual time series to just saying we've got the whole we've got we've got a time series for every pixel. Let's take this approach of um, taking our cube to spatial dimensions and time and taking some statistic along the time axis and creating an image. And I think it's that which really made people sit up and take notice and say, oh, wow, this is really cool. But it also shows just how clean the data is as well. So here we're swapping between the mean and the RMS of the time series corresponding to each pixel. The sources that are not IPS sources that are extending, which aren't scintillating, they just vanish. They just completely disappear. So it's as if you've thrown some filter across the sky and you're only letting through photons that have come from, from a compact source. Um, it's, a, it's a really, it's still, to me, a sort of magical way of, of, of displaying this data. So we moved on to the 2016 data, um, and at that time I had a reasonable amount of experience with calibrating some data using a standard calibrator observation, apply it to all of the data for that, for that night, and it'll be fine. Not in the daytime. Um, you start off at, at uh, a, um, an observation early in the morning, it looks nice, all the sources look coherent, and as the day wears on, your sources all disappear. They get completely and utterly incoherent, totally different from the, the nighttime. Well, is the ionosphere different during the daytime or something? Um, nothing to do with, um, with the ionosphere. Um, it's to do with um, the temperature. Okay, so it turns out that we can deal with, uh, with the presence of the sun as a one million Kelvin radio source but dealing with it, with it as a few thousand Kelvin black body heating up the earth and our cables is a bit more of a problem. Um, so this is a uh, calibration solutions between um, uh, daytime and early morning observation, looking at the phase difference between the two of them, 160 megahertz and 80 megahertz dual beam. The scatter is much bigger at higher frequencies. This is not ionosphere, otherwise this would be the other way around. Um, but the phase difference is much bigger on the longer cables um, with, the, with the turning into a, a delay in meters. You're easily exceeding a, a meter longer when it's hot than when it's cool. So there's um, an interesting... Um, uh, yeah, there's an interesting relationship between um, 
the temperature um, and the cable length, um, it, it, Horace, it gives you sort of perhaps 90% of the variance as explained by that. Um, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail um, if, if you want to come and have a look at that. Anyway, other stuff that we can use this for, ionospheric scintillation. Angie Wachewski, who's in the audience over there, um, did her um, uh, honours thesis uh, with me and Chris Jordan uh, on this. We measure ionospheric scintillation in EOR data. We've got a nice healthy three Janskis of uh, um, RMS variability on some of those sources there. Um, related, correlated, but not perfectly with the traditional metrics of, uh, of offsets. And also source noise as well, um, measuring that, um, looking into the fundamentals of how um, uh, of how these uh, studies work, uh, of how um, interferometry actually works. On to phase two of the MWA, much, much better for this kind of work. There's the baseline distribution and there's the Gaussian taper that we use and they match almost perfectly. It's, it's really, really beautiful. Um, came up with a brilliant new way of doing our scheduling, so I didn't have to do that manually anymore. Um, and so we started work on a, on a, on a survey of a much wider um, field of view using many, many overlapping observations. And this puts us into a completely new regime of um, variability detection, where the um, variance that we're measuring due to IPS is, is actually very, very small compared to the variance due to thermal noise. Very, very different from the typical situation where you're looking at a difference in the mean on source and off source. It's a difference in the variance, and off source, the variance is never zero. It took us a long time to figure out exactly how to do this, but we got there in the end. It's all in the survey paper. Um, uh, so I'll skip over the exact details of this, but we're able to do our fitting in a Gaussian regime, um, and that gives us an awful lot of um, upper limits where we know that the um, scintillation is not 100%, but it's somewhere between zero and some other um, value. Um, and that's led to um, a data release with many tens of thousands of, uh, of, of sources. Um, what's interesting is when you go into the very strong signal regime, you still get a scatter, and that's due to variability of the, of the um, planet, interplanetary medium itself. The space weather information in there, and that's basically what Angie is now doing her, her PhD in, and we've got a very exciting paper um, submitted on that. So we've got uh, data release one. We've done lots of science so far, including looking at um, high redshift galaxies, um, comparison with low far um, space weather of Angie's that I've mentioned, um, and then we've got a few more um, science papers uh, in preparation um, related to that data as well. We're not standing still. We've got a data release two. We cover pretty much all of the ecliptic apart from the area close to the galactic center. Um, and, uh, and that's the work that we're doing the, eight, eight, um, the, the flash um, uh, work with um, as well. But the future is very bright. Uh, there is still plenty more to be done with MWA IPS. Um, and we're very excited to carry on uh, with that. Um, We've got an increasing focus on um, space weather. Uh, we're working um, with uh, CSIRO. We're looking at using ASCAP as well. Um, I'm now over at CSIRO. And we have a huge asset in Mark Chung, the de deputy director, because he's really plugged into the space weather community. So I think we can finally make the splash that we've been trying to make with that community with um, low frequency um, radio observations um, that we've been trying for a long time. And just as one example of that, uh, what we've done is we've been taking these state-of-the-art MHD simulations, and we've been forward modeling the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the radio observables. So to answer Ramesh's question, we can take these um, simulations of, um, of uh, very big CME events, and we can tell you exactly if you had had a pulsar in the right place, this is the DM you would see, this is the RM you would see, this is the IPSG level you would see, this is the velocity that you would measure, and all of those kinds of things. So uh, very exciting time to be, to be involved with this. Um, thank you very much. All right, right on time. Thank you very much, John. Are there any questions from ECRs or online folks? Okay, questions from anyone?
Come on. Inflation. Sorry, I know nothing about this. Sure. But you're looking at ASCAP. How will scintillation be different at higher frequencies? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. So the um, the the scintillation index um, scales with with lambda. The density of the solar wind is obviously decreasing as you go away from the sun. We're essentially making a variance measurement, so that's dropping approximately with uh, distance of the sun to the to the power of four. Um, and so what you could, what what the difference with frequency is in, in terms of IPS is it's how far away from the sun you you look. So the higher frequency you go, you'll be well matched to uh, making IPS observations closer and closer to the sun. Cool, thanks. Any more questions? It looks like no, sadly I don't have one. <laughs> um, maybe we'll move on to our next speaker. Another round of applause for John. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rohit Sharma, and uh, I think he'll be talking about detecting weak radio bursts. Is that right? Cool. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah. So I'm Rohit Sharma, and. Uh, I'm a postdoc at University of Applied Sciences, uh, North Winston-Salem, and um, they've already introduced uh, me. Uh, I finished a PhD with him in 2018, uh, and today I will be talking about uh, one of the things which uh, they were introduced about the detection of the weakest uh, radio burst uh, in MW data. So I, I'll give a very very brief introduction of um, of, of of the sun in in general. Uh, so sun is basically a dynamic uh, ball of plasma. You can you can think of it as like a uh, plasma varying at a different length scale. Uh, you have uh, plasma systems uh, spanning uh, few kilometers to few millions of kilometers. And uh, the the biggest thing which is happening at the moment in helios physics is is uh, is the uh, in situ and um, uh, uh, imaging observations from the space-based satellite. So this is a solar orbiter. Uh, it, it's an ESO, uh, ESO mission. It is actually revolving. Uh, it's going around the sun, taking images, providing in situ measurements, and all. So so this is one of the one of the images uh, uh, from from the um, extreme ultraviolet imager from that particular thing. And it has sort of like uh, uh, produced these uh, these uh, unprecedented images in in, in great detail. Uh, so you can really see the, the the fine structures in there. So there are like uh, uh, brightening uh, flare uh, sort sort of things are happening uh, at a very small scale, for example, like this. And um, and this tells us like uh, there is a sort of like enormous uh, length scales of emission which is which is which is occurring. And there's a lot of structure, and this structure is sort of guided by the magnetic fields which is present on the on the on the on the surface of sun. And uh, of course, this is all uh, variable in time, so we do have like lots of time scale associated with that. And new uh, and new observatories like, uh, for example, Solar Orbiter and also Parker Solar Probe. Um, so these uh, space-based observatories is is actually giving us uh, a sort of like a um a, a new new picture a new horizon of detection uh, of uh, these things and why i'm talking about this because this is sort of like the the the, the framework in which uh, we 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 sort of like envisage uh, what we detect uh, uh, the, the radio burst in in mw data so as i said uh, there is a diverse scale of emission um there is diverse scale of emission in in radio uh, also so if you look at this plot, this plot actually gives uh, a idea about how what is the uh, variability in touch densities of sun. So you can see uh, the uh, this is the quiet sun, which is which is sort of like uh, uh, the the flux densities are increasing as a function of frequency, uh, and you can see on the top the active sun. So at 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 uh, at megahertz, uh, hundreds of megahertz range. So there is a wide uh, contrast between active sun and quiet sun. So you you basically have a four or five orders of magnitude. 
so when the uh, radio burst occurs so it, it it has like a very very drastic uh, um, difference in, in the in the flux densities uh, apart from that um, when we look at the the range of plasma um, and the radio waves actually sample they also vary a lot in terms of height so if you go to high frequency let's say you go to microwave regime you go to more than 1 gigahertz for example you probe by your l band and strand you're you're basically probing very close to the to the to the chromosphere which is very close to the surface where the magnetic field is 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 quite high and the uh, the emission mechanisms are dominated by the magnetic field for example uh, you have gyro resonance and gyro synchrotron type of emission mechanism and as you go towards the low frequency uh, you you get emission mechanisms like bremsstrahlung and plasma emission they they sort of like become dominant and in mw at meter wavelengths uh, it's mostly plasma emission and bremsstrahlung which are which are which are quite dominant and you you see like uh, it, uh, the 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 meter wavelengths and they actually probe a very very large fraction of height so there is like a, a, almost like an order of magnitude uh, in the coronal heights that we probe uh, at meter wavelengths now one of the problems uh, in in solar flares are uh, is is the coronal heating problem uh, i'm sure uh, many of you have heard about this uh, in some way or the other uh, the basic conjecture uh, of this thing is uh, the corona which is the outermost layer of the sun is at uh, a million degrees kelvin while uh, if the preceding layer the chromosphere is is, is at like two orders of magnitude lower than that so how can like the corona be so hot uh, and sitting on top of a cooler layer uh, so so this is this has been uh, the the problem of many decades in, in solar physics and one of the things one of the one of the theory, proposed theories of uh, this uh, as, as a plausible solution for this is uh, is a theory of uh, nano flares which are basically then which basically states that the there are these nano flares uh, which are occurring all over this all over the sun uh, which are which are uh, sort of like lower in density as conventional to the solar flare uh, but they occur so much that uh, you 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 basically have uh, deposited so much uh, converted so much uh, magnetic energy into the the the, the plasma heated energy uh, which is giving rise to this this thing uh, and the and one of the one of the thing is uh, but these uh, these particular uh, nanoflares are caused by the magnetic reconnection. So when two magnetic oppositely magnetic field lines they come together, and within the diffusion layer um, uh, they they sort of like try to, they they accelerate the particles uh, which is which is present in this particular layer, and you can basically basically quantify this. Now why this is very important uh, from the from the from the from the probing point of view. Because we need to find the signatures of this uh, particle which are getting accelerated, for example, uh, in this uh, in this nanoflare type of thing, and there have been um, um, searches for these particular type of uh, uh, particle acceleration or or basically heating of plasma in um, X-rays because uh, X-rays are obviously associated with higher energy, so they, uh, these these particles emit in in, in X-rays. Uh, and also UV, uh, the hot channels of uh, extreme ultraviolet, and and this is sort of a energy range which which uh, which which observations have covered using those which is like 10 to the power 24 to 10 to the power 32 Earths, uh, but the nano flares sort of like uh, are towards the lower end of this towards like 10 to the power 24 and less, and. Uh, 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 the radio wavelengths in uh, at meter wavelengths is particularly suited uh, as compared to these uh, partic uh, these particular wavelengths because uh, we see, as I said, like we, you see a, a larger contrast in the in the in the flux density. So you can you can detect uh, fine changes uh, in the in the in the in the in the uh, electron um, heating uh, population. So so basically, that is the reason uh, why meter wavelengths is sort of like a suitable for uh, detecting uh, uh, weaker uh, heated uh, non thermal population uh, we started to get uh, the idea of the presence of these weak features in our non imaging studies back in uh, 2018 when uh, when we were looking at the uh, the dynamic spectrum uh, from the from the mwa uh, during the quiet time uh, we we could uh, see such kind of uh, for example these impulsive features present all over the data set uh, and uh, we also tried to uh, we just showed about this this particular work where 
we try to uh, characterize this using wavelet uh, decomposition uh, and and then try to basically get the statistics on the on the um, on the on the player frequency so one of the uh, one of the characteristics of nano player type of uh, uh, um, emission is you need uh, is uh, in, the, in the play frequency diagram you need uh, a steeper slope uh, greater than uh, two uh, to to be able to sort of like heat the corona so that is one of the uh, requirements for that and we were getting around uh, 1.98 uh, uh, around that particular thing um, and so so there was always a sort of like a um, um, Evidence of, uh, of of the presence of these uh, these these uh, these weaker features in the, in the solar data, and uh, so Jeet's work, uh, um, which 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 is basically imaging work, showed uh, the uh, the occurrence probability uh, also, uh, which which suggests that there is a sort of like a, a, a weaker level of activity which is happening. Uh, so this particular work um, was motivated by this the fact that uh, we want to sort of like. Uh, we, we, we now uh, have a handle on the statistics of these events, but uh, from where exactly they are coming, we need to sort of like get a handle on the on the position and the location of these peak bursts. Uh, and for this, um, we actually employ a visibility subtraction approach. Now, the idea of visibility subtraction is basically um, in your in your in a model you have uh, two components. So in the visibility, which is basically a stationary component, non-stationary. And the non-stationary component is is basically is changing uh, over the time scale of seconds, but uh, stationary is sort of like uh, stable over over this particular period of time scale. Um, and we 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 basically uh, email, we basically apply the visibility subtraction to um, uh, to to uh, in the in the flare data because we want to sort of like get rid of. Uh, of the stationary component because you you want to get the uh, location of these players quite accurately. Um, so for this particular thing, uh, since uh, uh, our our uh, features were of the order time scale, we basically subtract. We basically compute the stationary component over a uh, time scale of a minute, and then we do a visibility subtraction, uh, and 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 get the res residual visibility which correspond to the impulsive component, and then we uh, image uh, those uh, those impulsive components. Uh, so for this particular uh, exercise, we took uh, quite this time uh, possible. So this is sort of like the dynamic spectrum for this uh, half an hour. This is the look. Uh, this is the um, um, this is how the sun looked like. So there was a, like a presence of a coronal hole there. There are some uh, structures there. Uh, and uh, in in this, uh, so uh, we basically applied the visibility uh, subtraction technique. So operations were done on the real and imaginary part. Uh, we compute the median uh, uh, median time series uh, by removing uh, basically the outliers in the in the visibility uh, space first, and then um, computed the residual visibility, image the residual visibilities, and also um, and after that we sure. also uh, provided uh, some uh, some threshold uh, so that uh, in in the image space also there are some outliers which can be which can be removed. So. So basically, in the in the end, what you get is um, is a is a is a is a, is a nice uh, uh, snapshot images of uh, of this impulsive component. And uh, I'll come to that later. And this is uh, a movie uh, which actually shows these impulsive component as a function of time. And uh, you can see the the there are these uh, these bursts which occur all over the sun, and many of them actually are associated with. Uh, with the with with uh, near the near the edges, for example, like this one. So, so we carried out this exercise for all the uh, all the uh, eight eight frequency bands, and uh, these ranges from uh, three hundred Kelvin to forty thousand Kelvin. So it's it's really really big, and in the process, uh, we sort of like uh, detected uh, a type four burst, or uh, sorry, type three burst, uh, which is in the region four. Um, and uh, and also uh, some some of the uh, periodic burst which you can see here. Um, so yeah. So now what what we what we wanted to do what we wanted to do is basically try to uh, try to see uh, where uh, is th these uh, impulsive emission are coming from in the space. 
so um, so so we what we do is we basically average in the in, in the time in the time uh, direction and we obtain uh, this this particular plot and uh, there we you can see um, the, the the location of the impulsive features are are uh, they are quite uniformly spaced so um, so they are sort of like occurring all over the all over the sun, all over the sun and if we, if we select uh, some of the regions and uh, plot the time series and you can see these impulsive uh, things very clearly and in region 1 at the end you can see the the, the periodic emission at, at 240 megahertz so basically these these are the uh, locations of the the, the, the weakest uh, radio burst uh, that that we have seen and if we do the statistics of course we are assuming uh, uh, these uh, weak burst uh, as, uh, uh, as as uh, as sort of like uh, originated from from uh, weak reconnection events uh, we can actually try to get a handle on the on the on the energies of the beam and they sort of lie in the in the peak of flare category so these are quite quite uh, small in their energy budgets and the and the statistics of this particular this is only half an hour of data we get we recover the uh, linear slope of minus 2 for this particular thing uh, now the implication of this uh, is uh, is of course so so these are occurring quite high in the corona so they must have uh, so, so the question is are they occurring uh, so are they, do they originate only in the high corona or do they have counterparts in the in the uh, in the in the lower corona so in the, in the in the beginning i showed you the image of this these particular small uh, flares which are occurring uh, so these are called campfires according to the to the nomenclature and so the, the next step is basically to see uh, any correlation with uh, with such kind of weak uh, activity in the uv which is happening and then establish a connection between low corona and high corona and subsequently um, so so this is something which is uh, which is quite uh, this, this these results will be quite important in that particular study and also in the in the space weather connection because many of these are sort of like um, um, uh, many of these uh, um, many of these uh, flares are are associated with open magnetic field lines, which would allow the uh, channels uh, uh, for the electrons to escape into that interplanetary medium and contribute to the solar wind type of thing. So, so the connection like that would be would be something which 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 will be important in this context, and uh, of course it will uh, more of these will will give uh, understanding on the. Uh, plasma heating and the acceleration process which are which are involved in this uh, and the other thing um, particularly uh, in terms of uh, a new opportunity which will which is going to be presented is uh, since we have a now uh, measurements from the from the satellite which is going around the sun we get the second vantage point uh, apart from earth so you can actually uh, try to do uh, a, a sort of like a stereoscopic of the solar flare so this is something which uh, we already have data for uh, from the last cycle, but of course um, the the data from 256 tile would be would be quite desirable for such kind of studies. Um, so the idea is basically you have a flare phenomena you are seeing from uh, X-rays uh, from from uh, sticks uh, which is on board a solar orbiter, and then you have your radio telescope here, so you can uh, enter the framework of magnetic. Uh, uh, magnetic extrapolation models. You can you can try to constrain the acceleration side of these non-thermal particles. So this is uh, something which is uh, which which we want to do in the future. And with MWA, we have a enormous archive which is spanning almost uh, like a solar cycle. So until 2016, we have phase one, which which almost covers the solar maximum part. Um, and then we are also having the data, uh, uh, also having the data on the rising phase of this next solar cycle. So that will allow us to sort of like constrain the uh, coronal heating budgets for during the minimum and during the maximum, and then try to compare. And of course, uh, since there is a lot of data, there is a lot of uh, um, there is a lot of um, um, uh, there is a lot of um, data, and so we don't also want to probably. Uh, deploy and uh, do automated uh, detection and uh, uh, training and prediction approaches uh, for solar space weather also. So, so in the end, I will just say, uh, uh, quite some uh, MW maps are are, are 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 fantastic. They allow us to sort of like probe very fine structures in 
all the um, time frequency and uh, time frequency domain. Um, Visibility subtraction is is a very promising technique, especially to to image uh, the uh, the the weak bursts. And uh, in this, we we showed that uh, we can we can we can get down to a few level sources. Um, and uh, these transient features are above, of course, uh, self noise levels that we show. And uh, we want to sort of like build a um, a more statistic over this uh, entire solar cycle. And uh, and also employ a new perspective such as stereoscopy uh, uh, using the uh, uh, so, uh, sticks, for example, and uh, uh, establish uh, more robustly the space weather connection. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Rohit. Sounds like there's some really awesome physics going on there. Uh, we have a couple minutes for questions. Are there any questions from anyone? Okay, um, so I have one, I'm not sure how good it is, but um, when you were separating the stationary process from the non-stationary process, did you have like a good prior that helped you kind of constrain one of them ahead of time, or did you have to like simultaneously infer parameters about both of them? Yeah, so the, the way we separate is uh, we basically compute the running median uh, over over the time scale, uh, over the minute level time scale, and then we subtract. So our prior is basically we are assuming that over the uh, time scale of a minute, we don't uh, we don't change the uh, characteristic of ensembles. I see that's clever. So that kind of lets you uh, isolate one of the components so that you don't have to do any complicated joint inference on them. Cool. And there. Thank you very much. I was um, curious if you know if the emission that you see is actually beamed emission or if it's isotropic from the points of emission. Well, uh, from the uh, from the in, the in the radio burst, you mean? Um, I mean, in the radio burst, uh, we don't have any good constraints on the on the directivity of the emission. Uh, we I was wondering if there was satellite measurements at all at low frequencies. I guess. Yeah. So I mean, what we have also assumed in our uh, model. When we calculate the energies of these burst, is an isotropic source. Um, with some, uh, although um, there are some uh, studies uh, where uh, actually there are some observation constraints on the on the type one source, but it's 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 very rudimentary. It is not very very well known. I would say. Did yeah. just wanted to add a comment to that. So these are supposed to be coherent sources. So by definition, they must have some directivity associated with them. Uh, it's very hard to figure out what it is because we typically have observations only from one vantage point. And there's a whole lot of scattering which is going on in the corona, which also is going to destroy the directivity a bit. So the rudimentary things which he was talking to was come from a long time ago when there were multiple spacecraft which were looking at it. Some of those opportunities will come again now uh, with Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter. And so there is a desire to do that. But all those guys observe only at very low radio frequencies above the ionospheric cutoff. So we'll still not have information about what is happening at hundreds of megahertz, but 10 megahertz and lower we'll get something. One of the objectives of uh, uh, this stereoscopic, uh, one of the motivation of doing stereoscopy of solar flare is to determine directivity. If we get a, like a very bright event, which we can see it in radio and also in X-ray, then we would have some some handle on that. Okay, if there's no more questions, then that wraps up talks for today. Uh, so maybe another round of applause for Rohit.